Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. This is Andrew Turner, founder and host of the GNC Sessions podcast. Today we have an amazing guest, Mr. Mike Southern. How are you, Mike? I'm extremely well, Andrew. How are you? Good. Looks like you're in your in your kind of uh, command center somewhere in this universe. I am in my command center. Yeah. yeah. In my question, is this going out with video as well or just as, as audio? How, how does it work with your podcast? Video. Yeah, video and audio. Oh, because that video. Right. Well, let me give you a little guided tour of what you can see behind me. You can see a little Chinese cat waving. I got that in Chinatown. And uh, then the next thing you can see, if I go and get it, is um, I went to Jerusalem, which is one of the most interesting places on earth. And the guy in a shop saw me the actual Ark of the Covenant, the real one. You know. <laughs> Well, that's what he told me. I'm, I, I, you don't think he ripped me off, do you? No. The no. actual Ark of the Covenants, that's a fun thing. And then you can see, then you can see copies of The Beer Mad Entrepreneur, which I'm sure you'll talk about, which is probably what I'm best known for. Really? And the rest of it, there's all sorts of interesting books. And my special, and my specialist subject is The Beatles. So uh, I'll probably talk about The Beatles at some point. I usually do. But I've got some interesting stories about The Beatles, which, uh, which is all to do with kind of what we're going to talk about, which is leaving a legacy. So, uh, yeah. So... Welcome to Beer Mats Central. This is the, the nerve hub of everything to do with beer mats. And a well, beer mat, in case you've got any Australian or American listeners, is one of these things, you know, you're in a British pub, you write on a beer mat or coaster, and you turn your good idea into a great business just using the space here. That's kind of my, my, my thing. So there we go. So Beer exactly. Mats Central. Here's well, no, that, that, you see, that's why I've got my beer mat behind me, you see. In 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 you know to ah uh, there to, we go yes to celebrate to celebrate your um, actually if you think about it actually this is this is actually uh, next year in 2022 will be a big year won't it It'll be a kind of a celebration you can you can bring out break out the beers why why oh, why, okay. is, why, 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 was, why is that then Mike why well is, exactly well th- th- there's a saying which they call it a Chinese proverb I'm not sure the Chinese thought it up which is may you live in interesting times which can either be a curse, you know, because there's warfare or something, or a blessing, you know, it's interesting times. You see, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, so I'm by necessity ridiculously optimistic. Everything's, everything's half full rather than half empty. But every entrepreneur I'm sure you've spoken to said a good time to start a business is in a recession mm-hmm. because things and people are cheap. Well, we're in the worst recession ever. I mean, so coming out of it is, is what's happening now. And of course, I've been in keeping in touch over the last year because we're now in February 2021 mm-hmm. with all my you know, big company people, my sponsors, investment bank, law firm, and also my entrepreneur chums. And obviously, the whole corona thing hit really bad. Mm. I mean, not for the banks because they, they got more money than God, I'm pleased to say. So they just work from home. Whereas the entrepreneurs, they've done some pretty sort of drastic things, some of them, you know, laid off 30% of the stuff they just had to. Yeah. But working from home, you know, one of my entrepreneur chums said, um, you know, I've got two people, not 10 people in sales. They're doing 80% of the sales from home. You know, there's a lot of learning going on. Mm-hmm. But you and I were having the discussion earlier. I mean, I now work in the insurance technology market. Um, and the belief is amongst the insurance community and the hedge funds of people, there's about $20 trillion sitting in bank accounts with rich people, hedge funds, whatever you want to call it, waiting to invest in stuff. So if you've got cash or you've got access to cash, now is the time to start thinking. And the whole mood of my entrepreneur community chums changed the moment that the vaccine was announced. Now, of right. course, it could be another nine months. It may work, it may not work. But everybody's mindset suddenly switched to, right, we're reopening at some stage soon. Mm. And the, the mood amongst my network is definitely, let's start planning. Let's start Mm. getting ready for it's a whole new world a lot of us will be working from home i mean you're a big technology guy as i am you know there's all sorts of new technologies which mm. you know three years ago you know if this young man eric yuan at cisco has spoke to you and me saying i've got an idea for a, another video conferencing system we'd have said are you sure about that <laughs> and he would have proved us wrong you know Zoom yeah exactly. is huge and exactly. um you know amazon where, where where do i start so there are opportunities so whatever you are whether you're like you and me, which is thinking about starting a business, you're going to grow and maybe sell or float. You know, that's kind of our media. Or if you're just a freelancer, you know, just mm. thinking, well, I'm good at, you know, script editing or, or knitting or whatever. Mm. Now is the time to start thinking we're going to come out of this. All you've got to do is be good at something. Mm. Then in, in our world, you're in my world, is build a bit of a team. 
Mm. So that's all there is to it. So, I mean, I spent the last year working from home, loving it, let's be honest. I've been, you know, selling to insurance people in Bermuda and all sorts via Zoom. It's been a lot of fun. And at the same time, um, I'm still teaching at universities. Okay. Uh, last year, I was teaching at what used to be called Cas Business School, live to 150 students at a time. That was great fun. Mm. Now I'm at uh, Regents University with a much smaller group on Zoom, uh, where I can actually do one-on-one mentoring with them as well, because these are supposedly future leaders, and I think a few of them will be. So, yeah, so we live in interesting times, but it's an opportunity. It's the biggest opportunity I've ever seen in my life. you just got to have that positive mindset and be able to turn your good idea into a great business, which remarkably is the subtitle to our book. Exactly. Well, you see, in, in honour in honor of the book, you see, this is the book you need to get. Oh, see it? Ooh. There we go. There we yeah, go. Absolutely. Please buy, please buy the book. It's... It, thank you. It's, it's ridiculously cheap on Amazon. You know, I mean, there are some university lecturers I know who have a book which is £100, which the students have to buy. My book, they get free because it's so cheap. My sponsors will pay for it. It's five or six quid on Amazon. Please buy the book. Chris get, my co-author Chris gets all the royalties uh, because it'll do some, book in the, uh, do some good in the world. And the way the book came about was I was in Cass Business School many years ago just giving lectures about what you and I know about, which is open systems and Unix and all that kind of stuff. And I was telling stories about the startups that I've been involved in. Somebody said, you should write a book about it. So I got together with Chris West, who's my best friend from school, who's a philosopher and a novelist. Okay. So he actually writes books. Um, I mean, I can, I can write, but, you know, I'm so not he's, Chris he's, West. So he's not like a ghost writer. He's, he's not a ghost writer. He's, he's actually, he was your, yeah, to your point, he was your oh, no, uh, collaborator. Oh, no, no, he's much, much more... Mm. Yeah, he's, he's, he's 50% of the beer map model. Uh, I mean, the example, because we were talking about this early, was we decided, we, the book came out in 2002, sold 100,000 copies, hooray. We decided to rewrite it, you know, in about three years ago. So we sat in a pub and we just went through literally every section. Do we still believe that? Because we kind of made a stab mm. in the dark back then. And most of it, we thought, yeah, we got it right. But we'd discuss a point from two different aspects. Me from the Will this get me a laugh live? Will people love me more? Will it create attraction? Him from, does it actually make any sense? <laughs> and we both got to agree. We have very robust discussions. We both got to agree on a point, then it goes in the book. So, I mean, when I lecture, I often have Chris there because he's so different. He looks at it from a different perspective. Um, and that's my number one tip to anybody starting a business, which it is not a solo thing, unless you're going to be a self-employed um, you know, cartoonist or something. It's two of you. There's somebody doing sales, creating attraction. That would be my job in the model. Then somebody actually doing the work. That mm. might be yours, because look at your background. You're a very good technical. But you've done sales. So mm. it's not as distinct as that. But I always say that, because I get ideas. I mean, you must get this all the time. I've got an idea. What do you think? And I always say, brilliant. Mm. I've never heard a bad business idea from anybody ever. Someone is going to make a fortune. Let's see if it's going to be you. you know, it's mentoring. Mm. Um, it's about your ability to find this foil. So when I'm at university, I say the best thing you can do is find your foil, your opposites, whatever you are, the opposite. Somebody loves to do all the stuff that you hate to do. Because mm. that's what I did at the University of Bradford all those years ago. When I was reading chemical engineering, I went with my mates to the Edinburgh Fringe. It was a comedy show because I know you've got a background in comedy. I wrote the show and all the other guys did the sound and light because we did a, a deal mm. for the venue that we got free rent if we did the sound and light for everybody else. And those guys who were just techies, technical people, turned out to be two of the original Unix wizards. They knew about Unix, which is the basis of the internet, the web, and every Mm. mobile phone. They were at university. They they understood Unix. They'd had, you know, 10 years of Unix Mm. in early 80s. Wow. We reckon there were about 100 people in the world who knew Unix that deeply at that point. Now there's millions. That's that's, that's very early. They were the guys. They knew all the other guys. Mm. Very early. Oh, no, I was there when the internet was built. I was there when the web was built. I was there when social mm-hmm. media started. You know, all these crazy guys with these ideas. You know, many fell by the wayside. So I can give you the... I, I teach my students, you know, how in the internet used to be and why email exists. It only has one purpose, email, is so they can read your emails. That's why the US government put all the money into it. So if you think that people aren't reading your emails, sorry. You know, I've got some bad news for you. And if you think people don't know which websites you go to, Sorry, they do. That's the whole point of the internet. So essentially, I had these foils, these these technical people who knew all about Unix. I knew nothing about Unix. I'm the salesperson in this model. Mm. And we started a company in 84, three of us in a basement. We'd worked for somebody else for for about a year. And then five years later, we sold it to Capgemini. I mean, I'm like, wow, 
that was fun. <laughs> so, and it's been sort of up and down since then. It's been a lot of fun since. So, uh, but no, just but be in the right place at the right time. No, but you, but so, so 19, 1980s, that, that was really, really early. Because I mean, mm. I, think I, got, I, I think I got involved when I was at GE. That was probably yeah. late, late, late 80s in, mm. in Unix because it was all Vax VMS and all that kind of stuff. Absolutely. All the digital equipment and stuff like that. My God. But, 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 when, you, but when you did that, we'll come back to that in a second, but when you did that, you, 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 you pivoted. You know that classic thing, pivot? Mm. Yeah? Oh, you, oh. You, you pivoted in, into music, didn't you? Is that right? Well, absolutely, because, um, and okay, looking back, I, I tried a bunch of things. Some They all seemed like a good idea at the time, and some were successful and some weren't, but you pivot. Mm. That's a very good point. You do something different, because what mm. happened to me was I literally got the phone call, came back, we sold the company. I'm like, oh, that's nice. You look in your cash what, what do I? What do I do now? <laughs> yeah, what do I do? Well, I had to do a two-year earn out with Cap Gemini, which is fair. Oh, okay. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Then after that, I thought I'll do something completely different. Right, I've got a bit of money now. Very dangerous. I've always played in bands. In fact, I played in a band with Chris West, hmm. co author, uh, back in the back in the seventies. It was actually an Oxford undergraduate band, even though neither of us were actually at the university itself. <laughs> anyway, and we got that band going again. And um, were you at Oxford Poly or something? No, well, he was. I, I, I was between universities. I've been thrown out of one. And I hadn't gone to the other yet. But we played in this band, so I thought I'll play in a band. Now, what I learned about being in bands is, you know, I can sing enough to get by. Let's be honest. I'm more of a front man. I'm not yeah. exactly George Michael, but I've always had the best <laughs> musicians in the world. So in the jazz okay. band, we had some really, I mean, well-known jazz players. Mm. And I put together a band, a spoof '60s and '70s band called, and I became a character called Mike Fab Gear. I had a big afro and, and yeah. we went up. But suddenly, due to a, a bunch of happy circumstances, uh, I became the top draw on the college circuit in the early 90s. So okay. I put out a picture uh, and we sent it out to ENTS managers. And one of the ENTS managers, bizarrely now, is somebody that I occasionally bump into in Hampstead because he lives there. This is a gentleman called Ricky Gervais, who at the time was right. entertainment manager at University College London. He used to book me then and I bumped into him 25 years later. I went, it's Ricky Gervais. He said, it's Mike Fabian. <laughs> anyway, and he always starts to chat. He's a lovely, lovely man. But I was top drawn the college circuit, basically doing covers with a wig on. Um, and I was the top oh, with the, the flares, college... with the flares as well. Oh, with the flares. Oh, it's the decade that oh, takes the pl- pla- What, platform shoes? And platform everything. shoes. Yeah, my platform shoe story. You have, you the... have medallions as well, medallions. Oh, all of that. Yeah, I mean, please look on the website at the, the, um, the decade that taste forgot. Uh, but my platform <laughs> shoe story is that uh, I remember I was, and I was big on the circuit. I was playing Leeds University, which is a big gig, 3,000 kids. And it's where the Who did live at Leeds. And, oh, and yeah. you're on a stage, and then there's a drop of a few feet, and then, then there's a gap, then there's the crash barriers, all the kids behind the crash barriers. And I always leap off the front of the stage with my radio mic to, to talk to the people in the front row. Tragically, on that occasion, my platform shoe went into a ladder. Ooh. And there was a ping as the as the ligament went and a click as the oh. ankle broke. Ooh. And I broke my leg. I mean, not badly, but I broke it. So I kind of crawl back on stage and the keyboard player says, are you all right? I said, well, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I'll do another couple of numbers. Anyway, I did the whole show with costume changes and everything. You feel no pain on stage. Afterwards, I'm not feeling very well. So I did go to a Leeds Royal Infirmary that night. It was put in plaster. Uh, then a better plaster in the morning. Then I drove home, which was quite painful. But the irony you of drove this home was, with a broken leg, with a broken leg in a pl- in a cast um, for, back to London. But the, the irony was I, when I was at Bradford, where I met all my guys, we went to the Fringe. You know, all my acting chums who had acted with me in shows were there, and and you can probably guess what the last thing was before somebody that somebody said to me before I went on stage, which was break a leg and I did so <laughs> anyway so I had a lot of fun see, but you see you, you, you've beaten so I was watching last week I think Dave Grohl you know the guy oh who, yeah he was, yeah, he was yeah. a drummer in Nirvana yeah yeah, so he, yeah. He, he they were showing this thing this this concert from like before Covid where he'd actually fallen off stage and he'd broken his leg and then the actual they held they had to hold his hold his legs so like the guy was on the stage the paramedic mm-hmm. while he was playing guitar yeah, yeah. For the rest of it. So, you know, you, but you, you, you predated him, obviously, by, you know, with Mike Fabgear. So you well, uh, Mike Fabgear is, is definitely ahead of the curve. No, it, it was tremendous fun. So I did colleges <coughs> for ages. Then I went to theatres, the big theatre tours mm. with the show called Freak Out. And I had David Bowie in the show, or somebody who looked just like him, let's be honest. Uh, then I became a corporate act. And then over the years, it, you know, I got it up to about a 10-piece band. I mean, I haven't done it for a while, but it was just such tremendous fun. But I did get to 
play. Why don't you, why don't you do? Why don't you do? Um, you could do it over Zoom. You could do like uh, you know, Mike, Mike yeah, Fancy, the, Power by Zoom. Well, we we kind of have. You know, I I can do it like a charity event with. Um, yeah, you because know, I can't get the ten piece band together again. It's too difficult. They're all playing in different bands. <laughs> uh, but but you know, occasionally I'll do like a, a thing with a backing track, and my guitarist, who's ex Wishbone Ash, will play right. live. Yeah, but it's but the main thing is I'm just so busy with everything else. You know, the the effort involved in getting a ten piece band together and taking it on the road, mm. I just don't have time for it now. And also, it's kind of what I did then. I'm like, I could do it tomorrow. If somebody well, said, what, "What was your favorite track, by the way? What was your favorite?" Track? Oh well, I, I'm a huge Beatles fan. Um, so uh, as you probably discover later, so um, I love doing those Beatles tunes. I mean, I always kick off the show like the Beatles did mm. uh, with "I Saw Her Standing There." One, two, three, four. You know, she was just seventeen. Um, kick off with that, and uh, then, you know, my live set is, you know, Brown Eyed Girl, which my guitarist sings, Honky Tonk Woman, Blame It On The Boogie, I Want You Back, I Will Survive, I've Got Two Girls Singers, Horn Section, you know, it's... it's, and it's like, you any, have you got any James Brown? Have you got any James Brown in it? Uh, we have done James Brown, you know, because people call it out, you know, get up, I feel like being a sex man, and we just go into <laughs> it. Super it's bad, a riff, let's be super, honest. Super bad mic, yeah. Well, <laughs> But you see, my musicians are so good, they can literally play anything. So if they, if uh, mm. if I just go, I feel good, they'll just launch into it, you know. And I'll have to, like, <laughs> carry, I don't know the words, but but it's a groove, it's a vibe, it's, so it's you, fun. But, you, so if you think about this, if you think of bringing it up to date, though, with you know the technology side, you know, do you did you actually get them recorded? Were they were they recorded? Oh, yeah. or, Okay, so, oh, yeah, so, yeah. so you've got are you have you got a YouTube channel with it all on there? Uh, there's a YouTube channel. I did bring out a single in about 1991, one or two or three or something, which was "I Am the Walrus," produced by a brilliant producer called Martin Russian, who I knew really well, who had done the Human League and the Stranglers. Yeah, yeah, I remember him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we did a version of "I Am the Walrus." I nearly got it on top of the pops. It's, it's, it's a whole story. <laughs> It's um, I, I nearly made it, but it was and it was so close, but I didn't quite do it. But no, it's, it's one of those things where I mean, I would go on tour tomorrow if I could, but realistically, I've got other things I need to do. And mm. um, it's but these musicians, I mean, my guitarist, um, who was, was in my band, has been in my band for 25 years, and the, the drummer who's now in the zombies, you know, these are my lifelong friends. And just the, you know, I could go to a pub in St. Albans and they could be there and we could just launch into a riff. I maybe put the wig on or not. That's, a, that's you know, kind of fun. Um, but it's just the joy of performing. Um, but then, you know, pretty soon um, after I was doing that, the book came out and I was a professional speaker for a long time on the circuit, right, right. doing 100 gigs a year and using the Beatles as a metaphor, wow. all of that. And, and that's like being a stand-up comedian, which I've also done a bit of. And it's like being in a band, except you don't have a band to worry about. You actually mm. get up, mm. <laughs> perform, sometimes get paid an eye-wateringly large sum of money. It's kind of gone away now. But, you know, I've, all around the world, I've done stuff. And when I play Liverpool, I often put on my Beatles suit, which I'd made, one of the, like, the early 60s suits. Oh, the kind of the, 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 kind of the tight ones, the kind of... The, the, the tight ones. <laughs> with, with the high collar, with the high collar, yeah. That's one. Uh, the guy who did the original was, was Dougie Millings. And I got his son to advise on the one because I knew somebody who knew him. So I've got like a Beatles suit. So I've been in the cathedral at Liverpool, the, the, the angling of the cathedral, mm. in my Beatles suit with a Beatles tribute band, you know, <laughs> you don't expect <laughs> launching into a song. And people are well, like... What, what, with your mop top on? Oh, no, no, no. No, I don't put the mop top on, but I could put the afro. Anyway, I can perform at place, and I'll talk about the Beatles later, but it's just the joy of doing it. But you see, in life, as you've discovered, because we were having a chat earlier... You get into a flow with things, then things turn up and you have a go at them and sometimes they're successful as measured by you make money, sometimes they aren't. You always learn mm. something. Yeah. But as you get older, uh, you think less about, I want to start a, do a startup myself, because you know, mm. that's how you and I thought of mm. when we were mm. 20 or 30. It's more, how can I work with or advise somebody who's doing that, yes. the next generation? And what you're really concerned about is legacy at this point. Right. It's like, yeah. what am I going to leave behind? That's why... Everybody should definitely do a book because if nothing else, that book, The Beer Mad Entrepreneur, is one of my legacies. Yes. It'll live forever. It's not going to be yeah. KK it's, Rowling. It's evergreen, yeah. It's evergreen. So your book that you do, if you sell one copy or a million copies, it'll be something you can give to your children. It kind of mm. captures your thought at that time. It's a nice calling card. Yeah. Uh, but then the people you advise, they'll go on to greater things. Because mm. again, I find myself now at Regents University with a small group. I had, you know, 150 students in a classroom last year, which is one kind of gig. Now mm. I've got a small group and Regents University, very interesting university, which is, let's face it, not cheap. 
but it's, you know, manicured lawns, small class sizes. That's the selling point. Mm. So this means I can do literally one-on-one mentoring with students who, where the, the pitch for the university is tomorrow's future leaders. They may go on to run um, Investec, the bank. They may go on to start right. their own startup. They may end up being president of Kazakhstan or somewhere. Mm. It's future leaders. And I can pass on to them, you know, material. You know, here's BMAT mm. stuff, which I've taught many mm. times. Here's how to do an elevator pitch. But literally, I can get one-on-one with them. And then you can give them good advice. But the best thing people like you and I can do is to mm. say, now you've passed my filter. You turn up, you work hard, mm. because some of them don't. I'm now going to win you 15 minutes with, whether it's to right. get an internship or to learn from them. Because that person can mm. call me up and say, well, there was no business there, but thank you for introducing me to that person. I really enjoyed meeting people. Mm. like to help people. Mm. Because what I've learned over the years is that when you're younger, you get mentored. Mummy, daddy, how do I do that? And your mummy and daddy will tell you. Mm. When you're old, you're giving that advice down. So you move from yeah. being mentored to mentoring. Yes. And mentoring yeah. in my model is always free. So I always say to people, if you want some free mentoring, drop me an email. Mm. I can always fit you in. And mm. I'll tell you exactly what you should do. I'm not a, not a consultant. I don't charge for it. Uh, I'm not saying, what do you think you ought to do? I'm saying, no. But listen to me, do exactly this. Now, mm. you may disagree with it. Fair enough. But you give them a little roadmap because the issue is, if you want to do anything, it's all on the internet, all the information you want. Yes. Where do you find the stuff you want? So once I've spent a short time listening to somebody, mm. right, and exactly you want to go from A to B, right. Mm. Um, of all the stuff on the internet, uh, let me have a look, right. The only bit you need right now is that bit. Yeah. And then once you've done that little task I give you, there's another bit out of about 20 bits, which I'll give you. It's information in context. But, the most yeah, but you see, but you see what you're doing. I think there, you see, you're you're kind of effectively curating. You're mm. you're using your 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 actual experience and your let's face it, your grey hairs yeah, and our, our collective grey hairs to curate this massive mm-hmm. information, and, but then index it to your experience. Exactly. You, and then, you see, I know about ten minutes about any subject in the world now. At least I think I do. Mm. But then I know somebody who knows everything about it. So once you've passed my filter and I've given you what I might know about, say, something you know about, mm. then I'm saying, well, I'm going to win you 15 minutes with, here's how you approach them, here's how you treat them mm. properly, here's how you listen. And yeah. they'll tell you precisely. So if you want to start a business making, I don't know, glasses. I mean, yeah. my good friend Jamie Murray Wells did glasses direct. Bless him. You know, I've got the basics on how to start a glasses business online. Mm. There's stuff about lenses and plastic and whatever that only he will know. Mm. And he can pass that on whether you're going to be a freelancer uh, or whether you're going to be a, you know, you're going to start the next glasses direct, because yes. Yeah, so, so whether you're, you're going to, what are you going to be, a, whether you're going to do it as a side gig, or mm. or it's going to be actually a, we're going to be a business effectively. Yeah. Well, I, I see. Realistically, we all have to earn a living, and a lot of us have mortgages. Or you and I probably don't, but you know, you know what I mean. People have mortgages, they have kids, whatever. So a day job is a very good thing. I mean, please do a job you love, so then you're not hating mm. going to work. Mm. But always have a side gig. See, this is what I tell the students at Regions or at CAS or anywhere, which is. You come here, why aren't you starting a business? Mm. Not an application or a platform. That's, you know, next year or when you finished. It's more, what are you passionate about? Skiing. Mm. Absolutely brilliant. So you go around people saying, I love skiing. Do you like skiing? Oh, you do. I'm organizing a ski trip next month. Give mm. me 50 bucks. See what happens. Yeah. Lots of people give you 50 bucks. You decide, shall I do the ski trip? <laughs> nobody does. Have a better <laughs> that's, because... when you, that's when you buy the beer. <laughs> well, exactly. Exactly right. Um, so... You start a little business. If people give you the money, you do it. You're being paid to do your hobby. Yes. And I give them a little financial target. Why don't you see if you can make money out of your little skiing business, mm-hmm. which pays for your fees? You can give it back to your parents or you can get pay off your student loan. And that's a great thing to say to an employer when you go for a job, which is, I'll tell you what I did at university, apart from getting a good degree in chemical mm-hmm. engineering, which is what mm-hmm. I did. Um, I started a little business. I mean, I'm not doing it anymore, mm-hmm. but it's my little side thing. Everybody should have a side hustle it's interesting, it's, interesting, it's interesting though. So, so, I mean, what age are the people that you are teaching? They are eight, over 18, I presume. So yeah. Between eight, they're, being eight, they're doing a degree. Is yeah, that right? Yeah, undergraduate yeah. degree. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, they're 18 to 21. So, they're, they're kind of what you would call Generation Z. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yep. so, my two sons actually are 15 and 17. Aha. Uh-huh. And um, I, I, was trying to corroborate them to go, well, to get, so you probably know Rob Moore, you know, Rob Moore, the guy from Progressive. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And um, he wrote, he's obviously part of the Prince Trust now. I think he's mm-hmm. one of the advisors to Prince Trust. So they ran a, they ran a summit last, last weekend. 
uh, the Yes Summit, Your Entrepreneur Summit, and they yep. had obviously lots of different presenters. So mm-hmm. um, there's about there's about you know I curated some of the presentations and, sh- and shared them with the guys and you know with the boys. But the uh, I think it's this thing about how do you stimulate you know the the people you know what what age should you start thinking about this thing about side gig and, and a, yeah. a company. And then actually, what do you? How do you step into it? Because I think that's what you're raising into it about how do you get them to to think about it? You know, th- think about the things they're interested in, and then actually then start becoming aware of how you could actually turn it into something that's quite interesting financially. You and, have and, to, the, and the foil thing is very important, which is you know broad generalization. There's introverts and extroverts. So I'm an extrovert. So my job is sales. You know, I've no idea how glasses are made, but listen, I've got this made to make really good glass. So I, I don't, I don't understand how the ski trip works, but you've got to come on it because I'm just good fun. So that'd be my job. Then <laughs> the other person is like, so, so Mike, let me get this straight. You've just got five hundred pounds from people to organise some kind of st- ski trip, possibly in Sweden. Oh God, here we go. Right, let me go away and see if I can actually deliver. That'll be Chris's job, not this <laughs> ski, but you know. What I mean? So you work on that, and then because I say to people, if somebody gave you money for something, you delivered it. You made a profit. It's a cash business. So out of the 500 quid, you've got 100 quid left somehow. Mm. You're an entrepreneur. That's it. The rest is detail. Trust me. Now, you could start you know, a multi-billion pound McDonald's-like mm. skiing business for students. Probably not. But, mm. you know, or you've just had some money doing something you love. Because there's that great quote attributed to everybody, including Confucius. If you choose work you love, you'll never do days work in your yeah, life you know, yeah you're just having fun doing your skiing and that's that's what i ask the students on the first day what's your passion what do you love doing mm. because in places like cas as it used to be called mm. it's now the city's business school or regions here are let's face it rich students you know mm. maybe they borrowed the money whatever it is these are people with some disposable income mm. and your passion is i don't know walking around london going for good food going to clubs whatever it is you want to do there's money in that Mm. And most people who are money rich, time poor, want you to organize it. Yes. If you do it, they have a good time. They give you nine out of 10 for the experience. They don't want their money back. Then Mm. you're an entrepreneur and you can scale from there. And it's something you could be doing in your spare time to pay for your ski trips. Yeah. Yeah, That's that's your view. Well, it's it's, it's learning the ropes as well. It's learning the ropes of commerce. There we go. Yeah. And it's the basic stuff. And you don't have to start a business. You don't have to write a business plan. I'm really big on this. Look, all I've got is a beer mat. That's all we got right now. We're in the pub. Um, you know, you can't write a business plan on this. It's like, you know, we do a ski trip. We charge 500 pounds. It costs us 300 pounds. You make 100 pounds. The end, you know, Let's see if that happens. <laughs> and, and don't go into debt and whatever. Um, oh, by the way, I have to be sometimes be a bit careful with the beer mat metaphor. Because once, there's a story when I was speaking, I was invited to speak in, of all places, Tehran, which okay. I have to say was one of the most interesting gigs I ever did anywhere. Mm. But of course, I wasn't the beer mat entrepreneur in Tehran. I was the coffee shop entrepreneur. And the metaphor works. You're in a coffee shop, you're writing on a napkin. And I was there with this crowd and two pictures of Ayatollahs behind me. So, yeah, so the beer beer <laughs> thing, that's kind of your and my culture. Is, 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 there a, is there actually a, a, a coffee shop entrepreneur book out there as well? And do you, is well, the, the, Iran, the Iranian... Is the Iranian version. I really hope there is, and it will be with my absolute blessing. I mean, it's a very odd gig. I mean, you've done a lot of speaking which is it was total silence for two days. And I was literally getting nothing back, you know, as really? a performer. Wow. Yeah, literally, total respectful silence. You know, men on one side, women on the other. Total silence is being translated into Farsi. Mm. And I'm beginning to think they hate me or something. And soon it finishes. Mm. Literally, it was, a, and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. The place went mad. They were stood oh, wow. up. They were cheering. I spent probably Fantastic. three hours signing things and talking to people and whatever. It's oh, just that's, that was their culture, yeah. respectful. Yeah, yeah. Not interrupt yeah. the guy. I mean, you and I have done American gigs where they want to heckle you and stuff. And yeah, good luck mm. heckling a professional is my view. Good luck. I've got a microphone and I, I do this for a living. You know, <laughs> I've, got, on the, if you're I've got the power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've been a stand-up comedian, you know, in the past. So, you know, I've got the chops to do it and I front bands. I've dealt with anything. You know, I've done it with a broken leg. So, um, yeah, it's... Um, no, I was going ask, 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 ask you, you know, with, just on your music thing. So I mm. have actually have a, I, I suppose maybe I was slightly, slightly, slightly later on in the in the kind of pop pop charts and the rock. So my my favorite band is Van Halen, right? Mm. God, God rest God rest Eddie Van Halen's soul. Sure. So, so obviously my favorite singer is. I'm sorry to tell you, it's not um, John Lennon or Paul McCartney. Yeah. It's obviously David Lee Roth. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, which is obviously Diamond Dave is still around. So. Oh. Um, so you know the thing is, I suppose the question I got for you was, why would you wear it? Why would you wear an Afro rig, a wig, and then sing Beatles songs? 
Ah, right. Because I'm deliberately kind of on the cusp of 60s and 70s. This, I mean, I can play any song that I want. In fact, in that particular instance, I used to say, oh, now I've got to do a costume change, but the keyboard player is going to sing a song. It's a guy called Andy Nye who'd been in Michael Schenker's band. He did Jump. Oh, Michael Schenker. I went to see him in Bradford, actually. Well, in the well, there we go. So, you know. Brilliant. So we did jump. Anyway, so Mike Fabio right, okay. with an image. If, if you look at the picture, there's me with an afro. People think, I get the joke. Mm. It's kind of 60s. It's kind of 70s. It's clearly silly. It's mm. fun and it's an afro and it's flares. So that kind of gives me permission to do 60s songs, which are my favourite. You know, Beatles, Stones, Kinks, Who. That's how I started. Mm. As soon as I became a 10-piece band, I was doing all the disco, the okay, all of that kind of stuff, funk, whatever, because mm. you got the chops to it. Frankly, people are there, they listen to the first number and they're either going to listen to the whole set or they're going to go to the bar. So the first number's important. <laughs> you keep them there. And it's a combination of, that's a silly man in a wig, this is going to be funny. Then, oh my God, those guys can play. I mean, they can really Right, 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 right. Then it's like, that's my favourite song. And the skill as a musician is having the right song at the right time. Because sometimes mm. you've got to let them have a bit of a breather. Sometimes you've got to do a costume change. Mm. The best advice I had when I was doing theatres, because you have two halves, Mm. And this is from a brilliant guy, Sam Schrauder, whose company owned all the big Apollo venues like the Apollo in Oxford. Oh, right, okay. Empire, yeah, whatever. Yeah. He said, right, Mike, always send them to the bar at halftime singing. So you always close the first half with a big sing-along number. It's either cheer up, sleepy jeans. Right, right, right. Yeah. Or hi-ho, silver lining, or whatever. And I used to take the wig off and go into the bar because nobody used to recognize me and hear them <laughs> talking. It's hilarious. So putting the songs in the right is that, order. Is that, is that what you call mystery shopper? Oh, yeah. Because I mean, uh, the fun of being Mike Fabio was I'd take the wig off and nobody knew who I was. That was also mm. my tragedy because there's certain, you know, people I'd like to speak to, young ladies who have been on the stage. I'd say, I'm Mike Fabio. They'd say, no, you're not. You're <laughs> and, you know, go away. Then I used to pretend to be Mike Fabio's manager, Greasy Doug Vanilla, just for a laugh. Is Mike Fabio here? i said, oh, he's just gone. But he said, you were great. You know. Anyway, I had a lot of <laughs> such fun with that. You know, it's, it's clearly a joke, but it's a joke because if it was just a funny man in a week who couldn't sing with a rather average band... Yeah, you, 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 Yeah, you, that was quite good. Let's get to the bar. Was they they'd, like, be, they'd be throwing tomatoes at you kind of thing, yeah. Well, I've had stuff thrown at me. You know, if, 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 if you can't handle that, you, can't, you shouldn't be in a band. Well, not, not bad, but... Depends, so how you, hung, depends how hungry you are, you see. If you're throwing tomatoes at you, you just open well, your mouth, you see. Well, <laughs> <laughs> now, I've literally seen everything. I've had good gigs, bad gigs. I've done huge gigs. I mean, I did festivals and all sorts. I really had the best time and kind of got that... I want to be a rock star out of my system. But right, also, okay. it's, it's not really me. It's me. It's a caricature of me. I mean, it's still mm. me, but it's, you know, Mike Fab Gear can do things. I mean, I was doing, I was sponsored at one point early on. I couldn't do it now. I'd be arrested. I was sponsored by Soul Beer and Durex Condoms. I was doing condom demonstrations on stage. And the reason was, this, just at that time, early 90s. Is this on YouTube? <laughs> uh, no, that material isn't. But again, if people found it, you know, or if I tried to do it now, I'd be, no, no, I was actually approached, this is true, by the Terence Higgins Trust, because it was all mm. like AIDS, oh no. Yeah, yeah. Heterosexual AIDS, this is serious. Mm. Mike, you're quite heterosexual. Well, yes, of course I'm Mike Fabgear. Um, but um, would you mind doing something for the kids to make sure they all use condoms? And so I was sponsored by Durex. Oh, because so you, literally, were the, you were doing the things at the universities as well. That's so right, I was, I was handing out free beer, which got me into the universities in the first place. Mm. So the bar had sole beer, which wasn't the official beer. And Durex, I used to do a condom demonstration on stage, which is, which I won't explain because this is probably a family audience, but it was completely hilarious fun. So I was literally demonstrating how to use a condom, right, getting okay. somebody to show how to use a condom. Okay. So, but those days have gone. You know, again, if I if I attempted to do that now, I'd be in so much trouble. <laughs> um, and if there was footage of me doing some of the stuff as Mike Fab Gear, I'll be on some kind of you know um, banned list. But it's um, no, it was just brilliant, brilliant times. It was the nineties. I could play any song I wanted. I had the best musicians in the world, all of whom are lifelong friends. Uh, just, you know, I mean, these are the gods of playing. I mean, serious gods. And... Oh, wait, wait, the, wait, wait, how did you get into music, though? Is, is it because you... Is it because your parents were, like, music that, teachers? Or like that? Or is it, well, or is it, or is it just kind of... Obviously, you know, sometimes it, it gets handed down, doesn't it? And people, like, you know, people, like, always sing at Christmas or they create yeah, yeah. a band or whatever, but I don't know. Well, well, kind of yes and no, which is a bit of an odd answer, which is this, which is my mother, uh, God rest her soul, was a ballet dancer in Germany before the war, but I didn't get her athletic grace and whatever. But she, she became a nurse, then she met my dad. And I always thought maybe all my showbiz stuff comes from my mum. But then mm. I saw a picture of my dad introducing an army show, and it's me, or I'm him. He's, he's like the compare. Because so, what happened was Chris, my best friend at school, 
went to the Poly in Oxford, then got into this band called the Oxcentrics, which did all the 20s stuff. And okay. he was just a drummer. So I used to just hang out with them because it was, you know, mm. and and move the gear around just to hang out with them, really. You were, like the, a, you were like a roadie. Yeah, I was like a roadie, you know. But there wasn't much roading to do. I just hung out because I was working for Tate and Lyle at the time. But then the, the singer, Adrian Sheen, who started the band, had to do his finals. So I took over as singer. But in that band, we'd have a set of 12 songs. There'd be two vocals. So the rest of the time, I was playing games, very bonzo, kind of stroke Viv Stanchel, you know, Bob Kerr, you know, whoopee whistles, boom, and you know, <laughs> dancing with the audience and this, that, and the other. Then we got the band going again in the 80s with some of the original guys from Oxford, but with actually some well-known players from a band called Loose Tubes. And these were like the gods of playing jazz. Mm. And I started moving the repertoire through from the 20s, you know, you can bring Pearl, she's a darn nice girl, but don't bring Lulu, through to, you know, Cole Porter, Duke Ellington, Fats Domino, you know, okay. jump, jive, jump into kind of 60s. And I realized I wanted to do 60s, 70s. Mm. So that was kind of my progression. But I, I, I'm a front man. I, I can sing enough to get by. I've always got good backup, backing vocalists. So it does sound very good. I know what I can sing and what I can't sing. But I'm the guy who gets the audience by the, the throat in the first number where they think, mm. Mm. I'm paying attention to this. Yeah. And I keep them there. Mm. That's the which point. Is, which, is, which is skill, which is a skill and a superpower. Yeah, you, you gave people engaging shock and awe, or you know, kind of engagement, yeah. and then, but then keeping the engagement up through. Through obviously, your gigs wouldn't be five minutes; they'd be like what an hour. Oh, or yeah. like that. Yeah. Uh, well, um, theatres it was two one-hour sets. Uh, a live gig in a college, ninety minutes through solid, and I used wow. to ask for that rather than a break. And you know, this is quite quite energetic work. But the, the other thing I did with Chris in the in the seventies, the same time we had we were in this Dixieland jazz band in Oxford, we ran a mobile disco called the Piglet Productions Roadshow, and that was all the old seventies <laughs> numbers. And, and that Piglet, is literally Piglet Productions. <laughs> Piglet Productions. It came from um, you know Piglet, as in um, Wind of the Willows. I thought not right, right. Was, um, Are you? Yeah, yeah. It was uh, Pooh, Winnie the Pooh. Winnie, Winnie the Pooh. Piglet. Yeah, yeah. Because the other guy, Mike Gould, um, you know, he was a fan of it. So with the Piglet Production Roadshow, and this was in the 70s, where we were literally putting on Blame It on the Boogie. Well, that was a bit later, but you know what I mean? It was all I Will Survive, followed by this, that, and the other. It's literally playing the whole record in those days. You didn't Mm. sort of mix between them. And also, what's the audience feeling? Let's put the number on to get them back on the dance floor. Because I'll give you a top tip. See, as you said, it's shock and awe. They see Mike Fabgear, the big wig. Mm. This is going to be silly. This can be crazy. Then we go into a song which is a song, one of the songs guaranteed where all the ladies typically in the audience, so it doesn't have to be, get onto their part and say, we're dancing to this one. Yeah, and there's yeah. a magical song called Brown Eye Girl because yes. they've seen Mike Fabgier. I saw her standing there and he's climbing on the tables. It's like, going to be crazy. I'm a bit scared of him. Yeah, the Van Morrison track. Yeah, Absolutely. They hear that, everybody goes on to the dance floor. You can do the same with an ABBA track because I put ABBA in the show later. The two girls go off, come back, blonde wig, dark wig, Dancing Queen, and it's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so we know what we're doing. So it's that, get them on the dance floor, get them singing along, give them a bit of a break, get the audience involvement, break down the barrier between you and the audience, so I get people mm. up on the stage and are controlled. It's actually very technical. It's no different to when you speak for a living. Now, mm. public speaking, um, you know, it's what I do for a living. I've earned a million pounds doing it. You know, let me just, you know, lay that on people. Mm. And this is where you're getting paid big money. Now, the good news is everybody else on the bill is, is an amateur, is a civilian. Mm. They've got too much PowerPoint and they're scared as anything. You're up there to entertain and inform. Mm. And obviously I had the chops to do it because, you know, I fronted bands and mm. all that kind of stuff. So standing in front of people doesn't scare me. But when some of the best professional speakers in the world said, shall I tell you why you're rubbish? I learned that there's a whole flow of doing it. And mm. it's exactly the same thing. You stand up, people are thinking, should we listen to this or should we, should we go and get a coffee? Mm. You're going to say something. They say, well, yeah, let's have a coffee. But hang on, that guy's going to solve that incredibly mm. important problem, he says. You know, I don't believe he can, but let's listen. Mm. Then you do your stuff and the TED talk is the classic. You've got 21 yes. minutes. Yeah. It's very structured. Yeah. And at the end, you will, of course, get a round of applause. Everybody gets a round of applause in a public speaking engagement, even the civilians. Mm. Often it's because you've stopped. Oh, thank God. <laughs> They're going, oh, God. <laughs> You'll get the round of applause because you told some is jokes. It, is, it, is it like the Les Dawson thing when the hook comes on? It's like, oh, you know, it takes some up. Well, exactly. And if you're, I'm sure you've done a lot of moderating. Getting these people off stage can be a problem. And mm. or especially, or even worse, the talky ones. I've got another funny story about myself. Anyway, but what you've got to do is put in the hook right at the end, which is, anyway, 
I'm running out of time now because you've got to keep to time. That's the golden rule. You're being paid to do this. If you run on 15 minutes because you've got another funny story, mm. um, everybody's going to hate you. Mm. So it's literally, well, you always ask for, here's the top tip, either the graveyard first in the morning wake them up gig or the one just before lunch or the one straight after lunch or the one just before they have a break. Mm. So it's like, well, we're going to a coffee break now in about five minutes. Mm. I'll tell you what, here's something I want you to do right now. Mm. Write this down. Now, the most obvious one is, if what I've said sounds interesting and you might want to be interested in talking to me, I'll be over there mm. with my hand out. Give me your card. Mm. And the more cards you get, the better job you've done. Mm -hmm. And you can sit and chat with them over. And then you've got a card and there'll be a whole range of people. You know, the PhD student would like some free advice. Yeah, absolutely. Or the, the CEO saying, I need to talk to you about sales. <laughs> Give me a call next week or something. You know, that'd be yeah. my thing. So mm -hmm. it's, it's this, you see, a lot of people leave this out, which is, what is the point of your talk? Of course they loved it. Of course your material's great. Of course they were quite amused. But remember, you've got five other people after you, mm. but you want them to be saying, well, I'm going to give that guy my card before I go to um, coffee. Mm. And um, the next day, of all the speakers, I mean, there's that guy who talked about the intricacies of <coughs> you know, fault management software or something. Mm. Fascinating. But I remember that guy. And of course, I shamelessly used the tricks of the professionals. Because what I explain to people when you're speaking, as in anything, you influence people in one of three ways. I'm sure you know this. One is auditory. Some people want to hear words. So we start just talking very quietly, getting the auditory people on board. When I think I've got them on board, visual. Up comes the picture of the Beatles, you know. Because by then, the because the visual people by then are thinking, God, is he just going to talk at me? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, hang on, the picture's come up. Oh, I like this. Then the whole point music. is... What, music. Yeah. Well, the kinesthetic moment, <coughs> which is where... You get them on the same emotional space as you. Either they're really happy because they're going to double their sales or really sad because they're going to have to lay off staff. If you get to that point, and I deliberately put a kinesthetic hook for the Beatles at that point, saying, that's why we do what we do. I get really sort of, you know, um, and, and then there's a silence, you know. Oh, my God, you know. I, I wish, you know, I'm in that same emotional space as Mike. Then you've got them. Then, of course, you can exploit them by being a one of these entrepreneurs, you know, get them to buy your $15,000 CD set or something. So you mean run to the back of the room? I mean. Yeah, oh, oh. <laughs> please don't get me. I've seen so much of that. It's evil. It's actually evil. It may, There's a great guy, Mike Winnett. I don't know if you found him on the internet. Mike Winnett. <laughs> he's called Mike Winnett, and he's done some stuff. He exposes, exposes what are the entrepreneurs. These, you too can earn a million dollars tomorrow just from a beach and this, that, and the other. And all you've got to do, and, it's, and he has a bingo card. It's hilarious, which is bullshit backstory. Yeah, I was beaten by nuns for 20 years. <laughs> then this, and then I've got this thing which ends in a number seven. It's only $897. And these guys, they're the, the dark side of what I do. Mm. Because I don't really have an upsell other than, well, you might not, <laughs> you know. You could, buy, you could buy a box set. You could buy like a, a box of your people. <laughs> But, but I, I've looked at products, I've thought of everything. I tried being a bit of a contraband myself at one point. Mm. You know, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's an event. You've mm. got lots of other speakers. Mostly it's the boring people talking about what you need to learn at the conference. If you just put one thought in somebody's mind, my thing is generally find a mentor. Mm. Get a foil. Yeah, have yeah. a go. You know, do it. Mm. You know, read our book to how you can do it and not lose a fortune, you know, because our book is all... I mean, the instruction set when we started, the company I co-founded and built and sold in the 80s, mm -hmm. literally the first morning I arrived and the two techies mm -hmm. are looking at me with this face, which means sell <laughs> something quickly. And I'm like, what do you want me to sell? <laughs> it's like, didn't you read the business plan? I'm like, yeah, of course I did. What did it say? Remind me. And it was like, you've got to sell, I don't know, 10,000 pounds worth of Unix training in the first six months or we go bankrupt. See, that's what that means, that red line. Mm -hmm. right. So all I did was get on the phone to somebody from the old company, one of my clients, saying, hey, you know that course you told me about about three months ago, we must do this really advanced course. I was thinking, yeah, we must do this really advanced course in about three months. <laughs> um, he said, we'll do it for you first. Oh, great, when can I have it? Good question. Let me just ask, how long to write the course? Six weeks. So I said, seven weeks. You had a week, just in case. <laughs> then who's going to give the course? Another good question. Who's going to give the course? Dave Luke's. Oh, yeah, Dave is brilliant. We love Dave. He's joining us in a month. Yeah, wait, uh, how much? And I went, um, 10,000 pounds. He said, brilliant, where do I send the purchase order? I'm like, oh, my God. Um, I thought, you say, I thought you'd say 897 then. <laughs> but no, no, no. I didn't know that then. If I knew it, it would have been $997. But no, and he said, yeah, great. So essentially, I sold a course we hadn't written yet to somebody who kind of liked me but really trusted us. Mm. Um, 
on the base it was going to start. Now, on the morning of the course, you know, literally that morning, I mean, I mean, you know, I'm still punching holes in. <laughs> <laughs> you get the binders, you got the binders. Exactly, you know, we're going to be late. You know, we, we got there, we dragged the suitcase across the snow. And there's all these Swedish computer gurus, you know, with their beards, but no moustaches, very scary. And and they're, they're waiting. And Dave Lukes, this brilliant guy, puts a foil on, because it was foils in those days. Wow. And it was a bunch of C programming code and a tiny font, if, def, this, and whatever. He said, look at this. They all looked at it and went, mm. And he said, here's what he actually said. He said, if you don't understand this, you're on the wrong course. And I'd fainted. I thought, <laughs> oh, they we don't understand it. They want the money back. But no, they loved it. Um, and we never took any... You mean, you mean the, te- the technical guy's being extremely honest? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bless him. And he was right, you know. But it all worked out fine. We, nev- we had a bank overdraft of, I don't know, and this would have been serious for some of my partners who had houses. I just bought a flat a month before. I'm like, well, if it goes broke, you know, I'll lose my flat, but who cares? Um, we, we had something like a 30 grand overdraft, which yeah. I remember insisting that the bank wrote was saying, yes, we admit we can't take your houses away now because you've got enough assets. Um, we built the company. We were cash negative one month because we invested in a, a doomed operating system. You may remember OS2, which never went to anything. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah uh, so when yeah, we yeah. sold the company, we owned 100% of it. It was a service business. We did training mm. consultancy. We thought we'd write products. We never bothered in the end. We owned 100% of it. And here's the best bit, which is, see, by then, by about 1969, by about the time we're getting in, you know, Unix is clearly going to be big. Mm. And all the big companies are thinking, we need to know this, what is it, Unix thing. Mm. So Cap Gemini or Hoskins, as they were, they said, "Well, there's these guys." Hoskins, the ins- yeah, Hoskins. I remember Hoskins. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the instruction set. There's 150 units. Was let's just buy them. So they called and said, "We want to buy you." And so we said, "Well, how much?" They said, "X." Now, one of my partners, well, Pete Griffiths was the guy who had the idea for the business. He brained the size of a planet. I knew him from Bradford. His brother, ex Goldman Sachs, basically said, "No, we want five X." They said, oh, huh, "Go away, you silly young people." He said, all right, then, should I speak to Logica or BIA? <laughs> oh, no, no, don't go away, don't go away. He literally closed this deal in about three days, which is, if you don't want to do it, fine. Yeah, do you know what? I think we will sell it. We literally got, you know, we asked for five, I think we got three X in the end, but literally in the space of three days. Because um, I literally flew back from America. I opened up the US office with a guy called Rick Medlock. And it was like, and, and I always tell this story, because it's a, you, you'll have been through this, which is you go to the lawyer's office at mm. five o'clock to sign the bit of paper which is going to make you rich forever. You know, you're thinking, where do I sign? Where do I sign? And, and, and the transfer is going to happen 20 minutes afterwards. It's like, yeah, yeah, where, where? What am I on the side? Dave, is it all right? But then, of course, the lawyers, you know, talking to each other, say, well, of course, you know, there's something else we need to talk about because we've all independently decided we need an extra yacht each. So, you know, <laughs> they, they string it out for another 12 hours. You always sign at five o'clock in the morning and you sign yeah. a bit of paper. Then you, you wait at the cash point and suddenly, ka you know, you've got this money. So, well, I can buy, buy, buy things. Anyway, then what we had to do, and this is classic, was we couldn't discuss with our staff, there are 150 of them, that we were thinking of selling the business because we were selling to a right. company. So right. it was totally secret. So we literally turn up to work that morning and it's like, you're right, Mike. You don't seem to have slept for a couple of days. No, uh, <laughs> Could you all come to the pub this evening? Why? We'll tell you when you get there. So you'll go to the, what was called the Slug and Lettuce in Islington. Oh, Slug and Lettuce, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Slug and Lettuce. It's now the Fox on the Green. Anyway, so in that upstairs room, which I still go back to for nostalgic memories, mm. there's about 100 of them. And it's like, so what's this big announcement? Has Mike done a big sale in America or something? And it's like, fantastic news, everybody. We've just sold the company to this man in a suit. And it was a guy called Jeff Unwin. They looked oh, Jeff Unwin, yeah, yeah, Jeff Unwin, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lovely man. Um, and it's very shocking. And six weeks later, you want to give the money back. No, I mean, no, you don't. But it's like, what have I done? And it's all weird. And what do I do with my life now? You see, I can now mentor people who suddenly make a lot of money. Yeah. Because they're beginning to think they might go down the dark side. And I've worked for plenty of people who are on the dark side. But it's all about money. As you and I know, it's not about money. Mm. It's about wealth. It's about your network. It's about being able at our age to do exactly what we want without worrying about a mortgage. You know, we're not as rich as Bill Gates or Jeff Bezos, but, you know, what would I do with another, with a billion pounds? I don't know. Mm. I'm, I'm never going to get it. Or even another million pounds. It's just, that's not the point. But it's this thing that, and here's what I tell people to do, which you, you suddenly get a load of money. It's like winning the lottery. Um, you're going to have some of your friends now hate you. Be prepared for that. Mm. I'm better than them. And you can't understand why. And you can't buy them a drink because that's Mike at the bar showing off Mr. Moneybags. And you can't not buy them a drink because... Yeah. Tight-fisted, Mike. Tight. You know, <laughs> yeah. can't win. So what you do, and I, I tell people to do this, which is go out and buy a physical thing, that thing you've always dreamed of. I mean, not a Ferrari, 
I bought a cat platform for the cats, which I still got, but I bought a jukebox in the end. And I put oh, my own things on it. Okay. So I've got a jukebox. Because when you're in that dark moment, it's, 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 it's a Rockola Regis, 1962. Okay. The one they used on, on uh, Ready, Steady, Go. And it's got my single on it, along with the Beatles and the Stones and all that. Yeah, because when you're in a dark moment, um, what you've done is you've anchored that experience, which is suddenly, oh my God, I'm rich or something. Mm. And it's a happy moment. You've, with NLP, you've anchored that moment. So you look at the jukebox or the, the ski chalet or the whatever it is that you did. It takes you back to the happy place where you suddenly thought, neither I nor my parents ever have to worry about money ever again. Because mm -hmm. it was very interesting going to see my parents and trying to explain to my mother, who was always worried that, you know, I wasn't going to make anything of myself because I've been thrown out of a university. So saying, look, first thing is I'm buying you a car. Mm. And now, I mean, you're not poor, but, you know, literally you don't have to worry about money. I don't have to worry about money ever again. Mm. And that is a lovely moment where... Okay, and where you're, you explain to your parents, you know, who are very upset, they sent me to an expensive school, then I went to university, got thrown out, but then I kind of did okay, that I'm okay financially. Mm. Um, I don't think they ever quite got it, but right. it, it doesn't matter. And every entrepreneur has got that story, which is, of course, people tell you, you're an idiot, you're no good, you know, shut up, sit down, you know, you'll never make any of yourself, you shout too much, and, you know, they all dropped out of school and maybe had issues with their parents. You can make your peace with your parents, if you mm. make a lot of money. That's the mm. main reason for doing it. Yeah. But, of course, the last thing you want to do is, you know, and Bill Gates understands this, is give, you know, $10 billion to each child, you know, have good fun with that. Because, to be honest, I, I teach a lot of rich students. I mean, you have to be rich to go to somewhere like Cass or Regents. You know, so you're coming from money backgrounds. Some are family businesses, which mm. are completely hilarious. You know, um, so these are not poor children. Generally, I mean, there's the occasional one who's got a scholarship. But don't, don't you think, though? Don't you think, though, that the because there seems to be a bit of a renaissance in you know in the tech side now. So mm. you know, I remember when I I you know I started, and you probably used that as well. It was a bit like it's a bit, it's a bit of a strange, mm. it was a strange career choice. It was a strange, strange. Mm. Why are you doing that? Mm. And now, and now, it seems to be the the cool thing to do. Did you find oh. that? I mean, and, and it's like oh. a it's like a gold rush. It's like. Do I, do I go into investment banking or do I go into be a, a tech entrepreneur? And it seems to be like the thing to do. Is that, is that well, what you've uh, seen with these people, you, 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 university students and younger people? Yeah, 100%. Because at, you know, at the first lecture at CAS, mm -hmm. I literally gave them all one of my sponsored beer mats and said, write down the name of the entrepreneur you most admire. And on there was all the usual suspects, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk is probably the most popular one, Jack Ma from the Chinese students. Mm. Um, these are all tech entrepreneurs who have disrupted the world yeah. and made a difference and this and that and the other. So, yes, I mean, some of them you can tell because I always ask them, you know, tell me where you're from, tell me what your parents do, that kind of stuff. And a lot of them is like, you know, my parents both in investment banking, so I think I want to be in investment banking. And yeah, good for you. Mm. If you get a job at Goldman Sachs or JP Morgan or Investec or one of my mm. sponsors, yeah, great job to do. They'll teach you, you'll do stuff. A lot of them are quite into wealth management, you know, because that's mm. a fun thing to do because they've seen it being done and that involves, you know, going to the cricket and looking after money. They all wanted to save the world because my roadmap for Regents is literally come to Regents, start a little business, your ski business, then, then become a millionaire, a bit like what I did, you know, have your little fun idea with your cornerstones and your foil and all of that, then mm -hmm. become a billionaire, which I haven't done, but, you know, I'll show you how to do it. It's not rocket science. It's uh, intellectually, it's hard work. Then save the world, you know, whatever it is you're going to save. What are, which part of the world are you going to save? You know, global warming, COVID, whatever. What are you going to do? That, that's a roadmap which really appeals to them. So they right. like the idea of being Elon Musk. But then I explain that I would not send my son to work for Elon Musk because he's mad as a box of frogs. Mm. I mean, I'm sure he won't mind me saying so. He's yeah. all over the place. And he's done some slightly dodgy things in terms of saying things on the internet where he'd be the most fascinating boss to work for. Mm. But you know, would you get what I want for you, which is the good experience, work for nice people? So I'm delighted to say I do work with a company called Akinova where... I've known Henri, the founders, since he was head of corporate venturing at Rolls-Royce. He's a lovely man. My son works there, and it's all working out brilliantly well. I'm so grateful to him. I've been able to do, like, Zoom selling for him for the last year, and it's been going fine. And, you know, it's, it's been a pleasure to do it. But, um, yeah, these entrepreneurs can be a handful. You and I were having a conversation about it. They can be very you – know, this is exactly what we say in the BMW Entrepreneur. This is the genius of Chris West, which is – Early on, we say, what are the characteristics of a successful entrepreneur? It's the obvious ones. Every 
book says this. You're going to be confident. If you can't get out of bed, you know, you're going to be charismatic. People are going to like you and you've got to be hardworking. And blah, blah, blah. Of course, there's the flip side. The borderline between confidence and arrogance is very narrow. Mm. So my job is to turn these regent students, that's actually my job right now, I'm teaching every week, mm. is to give them the basic toolkit, show them how to build mm. a little team and get them to be a billionaire and not turn out to be somebody, and not be hated like, you know, I've never met him, but Sir Philip Green. I mean, you just say that and people understand what you mean. It's like, here's somebody who's done nothing wrong in their own minds. But, you know, I don't even need to... Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a bit like the Star Wars analogy, isn't it? It's a bit like getting to be Luke Skywalker rather than being yeah. Darth Vader. I mean, basically. And, and, and that is life. There's a dark side, a light side and a dark side. Mm. And I put an underlying religion on specific, obviously, morality under everything. Mm. And I say, look, if you want to be a good person... You just need to do three things, and it's in every system ever, which is one, treat people like you want to be treated. So if you find yourself shouting at a receptionist who's done something stupid, you're having a bad day, seriously, that'd be my kind of problem when I'm 25. Then help people if you can, but don't get broke in the process. You know, you're not just helping people then going broke. Mm. Last one is top tip for anybody in sales, tell the truth. I've been in sales all my life. <laughs> and, okay, <laughs> and I kind of bent the truth a little bit at times. Every time I told an actual lie, thinking I'll get away with it, I never did. And then mm. they never came back to me. No. So I teach an underlying morality. So hopefully you end up rich and happy like you and I are. I mean, we're not the richest people in the world, probably. We get to do what we want every single day. And our strength is our network. Mm. And, you know, because of, you know, legacy is everything when you get to our age. What are you going to leave behind? And I've got two legacy projects in Liverpool, which I'm incredibly proud of. Mm. for which I earned not a single penny out of either of them, because that's what a mentor does. Give them advice, they're successful. You think, oh, I've done some good there. Uh, and they are the following. One was, I'm a mad Beatles fan. And I got to meet a guy called Rogue Best, who is Pete Best's brother. And Pete Best was in the Beatles, as you probably oh, wow. know. Okay. 62. But not only that, he is actually the son of a guy called Neil Aspinall, who was the Beatles' roadie back in the day, then later ran the Beatles' own company, Apple Corporation. Not Apple Computer, but Apple Corporation. Is, is this, sorry, is this son of, son of who? Sorry, son of Neil, Neil Aspinall, who was, Mal Evans, of, okay. who was one of the Beatles' roadies. Wow. Because what happened was, Neil Aspinall, aged 18, has an affair with Pete's mum, Mona Best, who's a brilliant... Oh, see. <laughs> yeah. And so the result is Rogue. Anyway, when I met Rogue... Lovely fellow. We used to go, he's my drinking buddy when I'm in Liverpool. Uh, he had a 1,500 pieces of Beatles memorabilia from Pete and his dad in a, in a lockup, wow. which I regard as being an offence against the universe. Anyway, so I said, well, why haven't you opened up a museum? He said, well, yeah, I met some guys. They wanted to own the stuff, and I never thought about it. So I thought, let me just connect you to one person in my network to explain how it's done. There's a very brilliant guy called Jonathan Sands. You may not have heard of, but he did the London Theatre Museum. Then he's a big memorabilia, um, movies guy. He loves all that stuff. You may be aware of the Bond in Motion exhibition in London, where you go there, there's the Bond cars. That's him. Okay. He negotiated with Barbara Broccoli and the Bond people, Eon Productions, for, for the, the Goldfinger DB5. So it's a museum. The other thing he's done is all the Harry Potter merchandise. So platform, <laughs> the shop, is him. I mean, Warner Brothers have since bought him out but he's the guy who did that. So I literally got Jonathan to go to Liverpool, meet Rogue, they had a good chat. They didn't actually do a deal together, but it kind of gave Rogue the, the confidence to open up mm. the museum. But he was having trouble getting the right building. Then wow. one day, Rogue's on Facebook with a bunch of keys. I'm like, hey, mate, have you got a building? Yeah, opposite the cavern. It's now the Liverpool Beatles Museum, Matthew Street, which is not like the Beatles story, which is lovely, but it's just a story. This is the memorabilia, mm. the gifts that Elvis gave the Beatles and so on, with little wry comments. And he always said, look, if we ever do open up a museum, I'll have you in the front row, Mike, and say, listen, if it wasn't for Mike Southern, you know, please do business with him. And I've been an entrepreneur for the city of Liverpool at the time. So, oh, wow. you know, but, but, but people knew who I was. It didn't really matter. He kind of forgot on the day. But the biggest thing... But you're, is, but you're, not, you're not a scouser, though, are you? No, no. I just, I went to Liverpool to study the Beatles, did a big event with Richard Branson. That's a picture on my website. So I got Richard Branson to come to Liverpool. We had a festival of business and did various bits and pieces. Mm. But my two legacies are, one, this museum. Mm. Um, but no, the biggest legacy for me is Pete Best himself walks up to him and says, hey, Mike, how are you doing? That to me is wow. worth... And he's, I've heard stories from him that haven't been in the books. Mm. And that museum, I'd like to say it was all me, but if I hadn't made that little intervention at the right time, mm. Mm. that might not have happened. Now, this means that if you and I decide to go to Liverpool, yeah, let's go out for a drink with Rogue, let's have a look around the museum, let's go to places, I can show you stuff. 
I might even tell you a story that's never going to appear in the books. You know, it's that Beatles joy mm. that I can do. The other, the other story about Liverpool, which again, I'm incredibly proud of, again, didn't receive a penny from it was, so as you probably, you know, if you've ever been an entrepreneur in residence anyway, it's like, oh, anybody can call you up and say, give me some free advice. So yeah, sure. So what's your name? This is in Liverpool. Chris. What do you do, Chris? Well, I work for the council. I do waste management. I say, oh, it's a bit of an idea about better refuse collecting. I said, so what's your big idea then, Chris? He said, a dinner. Right. right. For my granddad. It's the 100th anniversary of his birth. At St. George's Hall, this huge place. I'm like, who is your granddad then? Now, not a lot of people get this, but it was actually a gentleman called Bill Shankly, who is the <laughs> iconic <laughs> Liverpool Bill manager Shankly. who is loved by everybody, even the Evertonians. I said, you're, you're, you're Shankly's grandson. Yeah, only male grandson. And I said, um, uh, ha, have you spoken to Liverpool Football Club about this? He said, no. Here's what he actually said. I'll never forget this. He said, I haven't spoken to them. Do you think they'd be interested I am a season ticket holder. I said, uh, wait a minute while I call him up. <laughs> so literally, because I knew the guys at Liverpool. I said, look, I've got Shanks' grandson here, Chris. Here. Bring him in, bring him in. So he did this dinner. It was great. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he got into business with, ironically, the guy who's the nephew of the Everton chairman, Bill Kenwright. It's a guy called Adam Kenwright. Right. Yeah. There is now a Shankly Hotel in Liverpool. Oh, is there? Well, you go yeah. there. If you're a Reds fan, mm. I mean, go to the Shankly Hotel. It's got all the memorabilia. In fact, it's like, it's like a museum, like a testament. Well, it, it kind of is, but it's all the same. If you're, if you're a Reds fan, you'll love it. But in a corner mm. is my favourite memorabilia, which is apparently Neil Armstrong, first man in the moon, met Shankly once. Nobody knew what happened. But obviously the conversation went well because Neil Armstrong gave Shankly all the Apollo badges from 1 to 18, and 1 is very poignant because it's the guys <laughs> who died. They did it after us. Wow. Now, that is in a case that used to be in, in Chris's mum's house in West Derby. It's now there, just in a corner. But again, if you're a Reds fan, I mean, there's going to be a Dixie Dean Museum across the way, uh, of course, for the Evertonians, whatever. But Liverpool, you know, if you're a Reds fan, you know, we can try and get tickets for the match. But why don't you watch the match with me at the Shankly Hotel and we'll have a beer? I watched, yeah, I'm a Tottenham fan, I watched... Liverpool versus Arsenal once, and uh, Liverpool came out well on top. And I was there with a pint of beer, and Chris is there, and it's just, you know, the best experience. Wow! Again, I can look at that hotel and say, yeah, he would have probably done it anyway. Well, we should, we've got to we've got to go to Liverpool because my, my oldest son Ben is, is seventeen. Oh, well, there we go. And he's, and he's a big he's a big Reds fan. He used to be a Man United fan, but then when they had a bad season, he switched. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like like all like all all, all teenagers. Well, the, the interesting thing I'm talking to Chris about is, um, and Chris approached me about it because I kept saying it's such a brilliant idea, which is, you know, you can go and stay at the Shankly Hotel. I mean, I stayed at the Shankly Hotel one Friday night, but mm. it's it's all hen nights. It's just completely hilarious. It, 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 it's all, <laughs> you know, all these women dressed in, in, in stuff, you know. None of them knew who Shankly was. It's very much that kind of hotel. You know, you want to mm. experience what a room, six of you, whatever. Anyway, um, so... Um, yeah, the whole, what Chris is talking about, he says, should I do VIP tours to Liverpool, Anfield, and the, the Shankly Hotel? Mm. I said, of course you should. Because there's a certain breed of people, it's the same with the Beatles, mm. who would spend, you, know, you start with, so have you got 10 grand to have the experience of your life? Mm. I did this once uh, for the Beatles, and this is, this is a good story, where the guy who I'm now working for, he was at Rolls-Royce Aero Engines, mm -hmm. and their biggest customer was uh, Singapore Airlines. Mm -hmm. And they did a very entrepreneurial or intrapreneurial thing, which is the Singapore Airlines engineering manager said, look, would it, could you possibly maintain all the other engines as well for us as a service? For all the MRO stuff. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Um, so, you know, all the General Electric and the Pratt & Whitney, because we have to buy everything. Yeah. Now, some Rolls-Royce engineers, like, we're not touching those filthy things. Whereas the smart ones said, yeah, we get to see them in advance. Mm -hmm. So that was a nice business. Anyway, when Mervyn retired, they said, Mike, can you help us out? Because obviously they had to be very careful about uh, being seen about corruption. So even if they took him out for a lunch, they had to declare mm, it. And, mm. you know, it was all very kosher. So he's retiring. They're going to put on a dinner for him in Derby um, with, you know, a few people, you know, to talk about how brilliant it's been. Enjoy your retirement. Big Beatles fan. Mike, could you come and talk about the Beatles? And you bet. You know, some there talking about the Beatles. Next morning, he didn't know where he was going. We got in a minibus. We drove to Liverpool, went to the Casbah Coffee Club, which most mm. Beatles fans have never heard of, where the Beatles actually started, the Pete Best family home, where there's all this memorabilia, Rogue gives you a tour, and it's like, I don't believe this, there's the actual Beatles PA, and this, that, and the other. And just when he's got his head around that, oh, look who's popped in to come and have a bit of a chat. It's Mr. Peter Best. Oh. <laughs> it's like, hi, you know. 
And I actually had to say to Pete, look, Pete, mate, I'm really sorry. I've got to get him down to Abbey Road now. So anyway, that's enough with Pete. And, you know, and yeah, you had to pay Pete something, but this was the greatest day of the guy's life. And I took him to London because there's London things you can mm. do to do with the Beatles where it's not quite what you expect. This is obviously, you go to Abbey Road. Mm. Uh, you know, um, see, it's being able to do that and the VIP experience um, when you've got a good brand like Liverpool Football Club, Shankly, or the Beatles, Mm. There are certain people saying, if I'm paying less than 10 grand for this experience, what's going on? I mean, well, no, I mean, I think it's, 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 it's I mean, I, when I was working in, in uh, Shanghai, in China, mm. uh, the, doing some stuff at Walmart a, while, a few mm. years ago, literally, the, if you look in the, Shanghai, in the China Daily, yep. it's, it's all about the Premier League. It's all about yeah. what, what's Liverpool, Chelsea, all those. It, the, 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 you don't realize, actually, until you're outside the country we were born in, how, you know, the, these iconic, Iconic things that the, the, the history has created, and how much actual um, how much love it is actually for for these things you know internationally, and then how much love and respect for it is. I mean, obviously, the stuff that's been done outside the UK, but it's sure. it's, it's amazing. Wow. Uh, exa- well, the, the Beatles thing is very interesting because see, my kinesthetic moment that I put in my Beatles story. I talk about when the Beatles appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show, famous in nineteen. Mm, that's right. Yeah, yeah, hundred million people watched it. I said, well, that was then. But, but of course, every American who was alive at that time remembers specifically or thinks they do. I was in my front room with my parents. We watched the mm. Beatles and it changed my life. Mm. And I show a clip of McCartney doing the same song at mm. about 2000. Cuts to a guy in the audience our age who just bursts into tears. Mm. He gets taken back. Now, that guy is now going right. to spend 100 bucks on merchandise. So there's an emotional attachment with the mm. Beatles of people, probably our age, but you know, you're, you're a bit later, whatever. But the interesting thing is, I mean... I had the guy who ran, who runs the Grammys Museum. Mm. T- he came to Liverpool. We walked around the Caz Bar. We talked about it. And he said to Rogue, well, of course, you know, probably interest in the Beatles is going to wane about 2020 because, you know, the next generation, <laughs> they're going to be something else. Now, Apple Corporation, the Beatles company, which, of course, Rogue's dad ran for a long time, is right. very clever about keeping, you could say it's the myth, but the whole Beatles thing alive. Because, mm. you, know, you know, the next thing that's going to happen with the Beatles is... The Let It Be film, which is full of shouting and arguing, revamped, redone by Peter Jackson, who do, who's done Lord, oh, yeah, Rings. Lord of the Rings. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, this version is going to be actually be all got on brilliantly well. You know, it's kind of rewriting history. But that'll come out sometime in the autumn. There'll be a whole new interest in the Beatles. And there will literally be Hiram J. Beatle fan the third. Yeah. Thinks, like the next generation. I want to go to Liverpool. Mm. What's the most I can possibly spend for the best possible experience? Because somebody said to me, all right, Mike, if you're so clever, what could I get for 100 grand? I'm thinking, I can come up with something. I mean, it involves you arriving here, doing that. You know, mm. There'll be a Beatles band there. You can pretend to be in the Beatles playing at the cavern for the mm. time because you probably want to get up and sing another number. Then you get to go to here, then you go to go there. And Rogue, bless him, is selling bits of the Casbah, you know, stuff from his mum, souvenir stuff. He, he sent me one. It's brilliant. It's like a you know, bit of the old Casbah stage. There's an infinite... Um, but it's about the experience. It's yeah, about... Yeah. I got to meet, and of course with Liverpool, you won't get, you know, well, well, for enough money, I'm sure you could get Jürgen Klopp. You know, frankly, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, Jürgen, how much? And there what you do, I always say to people is, Jürgen, when are you free? We'll do it then. That's the clever, that's how I got Branson for Liverpool. You know, mm-hmm. when's he free? We'll do it then. The interesting, uh, thing, is, the interesting thing is, in Liverpool, because obviously I, I used to work in the, in the 80s, actually, I, for a while, I, I worked in the Port Liverpool building. Mm, mm. Uh, I worked for a company called Fraser Williams, you may have heard mm. of them. Mm. And um, they, they, they were doing accounting software. The, the, the thing is that the, the, where the Beatles Museum is, because that's actually in, mm. in, the, in the docks, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually the cavern is actually, uh, no. the, the cavern isn't the cavern. The cavern's obviously back down in the town centre, isn't it? It's down like that, it's that cobble okay. street. You, you see, you've done the classic thing we say, you say the Beatles Museum, which is called the Beatles Story, is in the docks, which it is. Mm. And everybody goes there. And it's a great place to go to. Mm. It's not a museum. It doesn't have museum articles. Yeah, it's like a it's like a merch shop store. Basically. Yeah, yeah, it's like a, and good for them. I know the guys really well. And there's there's another place they've got. So that's all down on on um, the Royal Docks. Docks yeah. And if you want cheering up, there's the Slavery Museum. There's a whole bunch of stuff. Because <laughs> what happened was the uh, when Liverpool was about to go bankrupt, Michael Heseltine mm. argued with Margaret Thatcher that a lot of money should go into Liverpool. So you can see it when you walk around. So you've got the whole Albert Docks area, whatever yeah. it is you're into. There's there, then of course the cavern is right in the center of town, but it's yeah. like 10 minutes walk. Yes, yeah, about yeah. Liverpool is everything. Mm. You know, if you did a walking tour, you could see 90% of what you want to see 
yes. literally by walking around mm. and it's beautiful and there's the Hard Day's Night Hotel. It, I mean, I'm so pleased that Rogue has got the Liverpool Beatles Museum in Matthew Street because so many people arrive in Matthew Street think, well, I'll go and have a pint in the cavern. Great, you know, I'm in the cavern, there's a band playing Beatles tunes. Then, is that it? Well, you could sit in the pub where the Beatles used to meet when they were playing in the cavern. That was about mm. it. But now you can go across the road, you spend your whatever road mm. charges, see the actual stuff. And it's like, mm. I don't believe I was going to see that. You do the four floors. Then, as my friend Jonathan Sands used to explain to me, which is you spend, I don't know, let's say it's 15 pounds to get into a, a place, you know, mm. bond in motion. You'll spend 15 quid on the way out. And of course, the, yeah, yeah, okay. His yeah. thing, the platform nine and three quarters, you've probably been there uh, to King's Cross. It's free to have your picture taken. Yes. Yeah. Uh, unless you want them to take it, which is probably mm. a good idea. Yeah. Then it's all free and you queue up and there's huge queues. Then you walk into the shop, you buy something. Mm. And you've got buying the scarves there, and the hats and the, yeah, all of that. Yeah, and he's got yeah. shops at Heathrow and all of that. Mm. And he's very interesting personally about how, as he calls it, Joanne, or as we know her, J.K. Rowling, feels about all of this. Mm. Because it's she doesn't want to saturate the brand. She doesn't want to have, you know, half of Leicester Square as Harry Potter, whatever, mm. da, 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 da. Um, The big thing is, of course, the studio, Warner Brothers Studio, where you go and have mm. your Harry Potter experience. Yeah. You see, with everything, it's... Uh, I remember I stood on Liverpool docks one day with somebody from Warner Brothers, it happened, and he was saying to me, this is, oh, you know, long, 10 years ago or something, why on earth is this, isn't there some kind of Cirque du Soleil, super multimedia experience of the Beatles? You walk in, you spend 50 pounds and you have the ultimate Beatle experience. I said, it's because the Beatles industry in Liverpool doesn't quite get it yet. And there yes. should be one of those in Shanghai where you can go into the cavern and go to Hamburg and, and go to Shea Stadium. But, is it, but, and, is it, but isn't that because of the isn't that because of the understated way that the British psyche and the British population operate? You know, we're not, we're not. Yeah. We're not Hollywood, are we? We're not, we're not, yeah. you know, it's that thing about the different cultural approach to that kind of thing. But you, it basically needs a bit of marketing, that's what you're saying. It needs, it it, needs some marketing pizzazz. Well, well, this is the thing which used to really wind me up because I'd arrive at Lime Street Station and to put this into perspective, it's two hours from London, so it's a quick trip and it's not expensive. Mm. You know, because if you're a bit clever with affairs, you don't have to spend 300 quid. Now, I've mm. never spent more than 50 quid first class. You're just a, a bit clever about it. You mm. arrive at Lime Street Station and all you see is a statue of Ken Dodd and Bessie Braddock. <laughs> it's not welcome the, to the, 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 the Diddy Men. The Diddy Men. Yeah, exactly. It's not welcome to Beatles Land. You've come to the Beatles place because, frankly, the people who run things like the Cavern and the Beatles story up till recently were like, well, they're going to come here anyway. They're yeah. going to spend their money. We're doing fine. What are you making such a fuss about, Mike? I'm saying, listen, you would have, you know, I mean, I actually went on the Queen Elizabeth II because it was going to dock in Liverpool, spoke on the boat about Richard Branson, about the Beatles. Now, here's a cruise ship arriving that probably when they go to Matthew Street and go for their pint in the cabin, go to the Beatles story if they're mad on the Beatles, you know, they wouldn't even stay at the Hard Day's Night Hotel, might spend, I don't know, you're pushing 50 pounds. I'm thinking they want to spend 150 pounds by going to this amazing thing on the dock where mm. they walk in and they're suddenly in a hologram with John Lennon. Mm. But I had this conversation with the Salvation Army. It was hilarious. I was trying to give them advice on what to do with Strawberry Field. Now, Strawberry Field oh, yeah, okay. is, yeah, a, yeah. is a kid's home. And it's where John Lennon climbed over the wall. And there was an old building since knocked down. Mm. And they had this idea of, you know, there's now a new building. Let's turn that building, the new building, or rebuild it into a home for kids with mild to moderate learning disabilities. They got one in Essex. Mm. Then, of course, it's the John Lennon Garden, had the John Lennon experience. And they asked me for my advice. And I said, because they were trying to raise, I don't know, Seven million pounds. I said, really simple. Go and find Hiram Beetle fan the third in Liverpool, in America, in Denver, mm. who would spend that in an instant to have a statue of mm. himself with John Lennon sitting on a bench talking mm. about imagine. Start there. And they mm. said, we can't do that. We can't raise money in America. And I said, well, this is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I mean, go where the money is. Who would spend more than anything else just to have? And of course, their grandchildren going, look, there's granddad's statue. Look, he's with mm. John Lennon. This whole thing is sponsored by Hiram J. Beetle found the third. Now, the irony of the whole thing about that is that the Salvation Army is completely different in America because so, I researched them, went over there. Mm. So in the UK, it's kind of nice. You've got the brass bands. They do astonishing work with people. I mean, mm. they're so good. In America, you suddenly think, this is a bit different. So I went to Los Angeles and I went to Las Vegas. In those two places, at least, you can walk into a Salvation Army Center, no questions asked, three-course meal. So if you're down on your luck with the gambling or alcohol, whatever, you don't even have to sit and talk about Jesus or anything. 
The reason the Salvation <laughs> Army has so much money is very simple. Now, you'll be familiar with McDonald's and you probably know who Ray Kroc is. Yeah. The guy who built, you know, there's that great film, The Founder, mm. um, about Batman, how he Batman, built it. Batman, Michael Keaton, yeah. Exactly. Great movie. I, w- I get the students to watch it because it's how to build a business. Mm. It's not your idea. You don't make the handbags. You just turn it into a franchising model. Anyway. Mm. And all entrepreneurs in movies, I've noticed, are actually nicer in the movies than they were in are, are you are you in Are you in flipping burgers or are you actually in real estate? Well, exactly. When he realised that, now he wasn't the nicest man in the world. He comes across a lot nicer than he actually was. Anyway, but the only was when Ray Kroc's widow died, mm-hmm. he left money to the Salvation Army. Two billion dollars. <laughs> wow. And good wow. for her because that money is being spent well. So this whole thing about iconic brands so mixing the... You this Salvation Army hotel then down, down the strip in Las Vegas. Well, there we go. Yeah, it's just... <laughs> it's the most extraordinary place and it's clear they know what they're doing. So, see, going back to the students, they want to make a billion pounds just so they can say I made a billion pounds. They don't understand what that means how mm. it could turn them into an evil person. Uh, if they do, they can solve something like... I mean, I would say to them, if it was me solving something, if I suddenly had a billion pounds... It's homelessness in London. Drives me mad. Mm. You know, mm. How can this possibly happen when there's people on the street? You know, mm. it's, It must be a lack of funding. Or I don't know. Let's talk to the Salvation and let's talk to whatever. Because mm. when I see a person on the street in Soho, mm. uh, you know, I want to intervene, but I'm the wrong person. I mean, I'm mm. a member of a club called, or I was a member of a club called Houses and Barnabas, which gets unemployed people into work. Mm. It's a members club, but that's what it does. So what are you going to solve? I mean, your billion pounds kind of helps. Mm. And of course, you could go back to your old school and explain to your maths teacher that you were wrong about me. Look, I've got a billion pounds and you now drive a Prius, I drive a Mercedes. But that's bad karma. Well, anyway. But what you're, what you're saying though is it's a bit like, how do you build, how do you build the right principles into, huh. the, into the future generations? So it's not about all the, it's actually making a difference, making an impact on the world and giving back and exactly. actually fixing some of these big macro problems that we've got rather than actually just you know, maybe going down the wrong the wrong route. That's what you, that's what you kind of. And I suppose it's, it's. I suppose that's that's. Um, are you saying that you've observed that that could be a challenge, or do you think that's yeah. going to be easy? Well, it's always a challenge when you suddenly make a lot of money. And I was very upset about six weeks later because you have a feeling of anticlimax. What am I going to do now? Why do some mm. of my friends hate me? And fortunately, I didn't go down the route of you know I've got a lot of money. Do what I say. You know, this could be in a very yeah, yeah. context. Yeah. Yeah. And some entrepreneurs do. But mm. it's uh, no, it's this you know clash between good and evil, which I which I study on a daily basis, mm. without a bit getting religious on anybody because. Mm. But that's why you know I went to Jerusalem just to what's all this about? There's three big religions there, and the Armenians. Yeah, there must be something. What does it all mean? Mm. And I can't say to you know a student do that for the baby Jesus because you know if I'm a Christian because they might be a Muslim or something. But when you pick out the three principles, you know, treat people like you want to be treated, mm. help people without going broke, and tell the truth. Every single religious, spiritual, moral, even picking like people like Ricky Gervais, who are card-carrying atheists, there's definitely no God. He may be right, who knows? If you watch his afterlife, he kind of comes to the same conclusion, which is a brilliant, brilliant thing. Some of it was filmed near my house, it's great, which is just be nice to people, why the hell not? Which is what, and of course, religions yeah. go wrong when it's like, oh, you know, I know it says you can't kill people, but, you know, um, I've had a word with God and you can kill them because they're the wrong kind of Christian or something. You know, clearly there's something wrong with this. So if I can subliminally um, help them deal with that moment, either dealing with the fact, look, my parents got more money than God. You know, they've got 27 oil fields in Kazakhstan or something. Um, and their father is probably of quite an interesting character, to put it politely. Mm. If you suddenly do win the lottery or sell your business or whatever, you know, be prepared to, you know, buy a jukebox. Don't be, don't turn into a shitbag. Do what you want. And then the best legacy is when you've clearly done some good. Now, probably that Liverpool Beatles Museum, the Shankly Hotel, you know, I could claim 1% of that realistically. Mm. But they'd have probably done it anyway. And the best part of it is nobody's ever going to look at those two buildings and say, oh, that's Mike's own. I mean, if I tell them, they probably would. But mostly it's just like, I've done some good. Uh, Shanks is remembered better. It's a better place. Every single girl who goes on a head night to the Shankly Hotel has a good evening. I can just say, well, I've done some good. Uh, as long as they aren't tying somebody up with gaffer tape onto the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> the inflatable men. <laughs> yeah, and all of, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, it's just absolutely brilliant. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's about, you see, when you get to our age, it's about legacy. I mean, I, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be able to go into a university. I'm not an academic and, you know... You can teach entrepreneurship as an academic discipline. Of course you can. How to write a business plan. 
But I, I, I'm quite sort of um, amused by people, you know, lecturing me on entrepreneurship who have never started a business. I'm saying, well, you're academically 50 million times better than me. You clearly know some stuff, but you, you've not been there like you and I have thinking, can we pay people this month? Uh, uh, this has gone horribly wrong, you know. A customer's been totally horrible to oh, what you, So what you're saying is you come across people who, who kind of um, say that they've been through these kind of life stages and these experiences, mm. but they don't, they've never actually really done it in, yeah, exactly. in, in, well, in, in real life. Well, well, let me ask you this question. You've been a you know, very successful guy, you've done a lot of entrepreneurial things. What's your personal opinion on bricolage? Bricolage, come on, bricolage. You haven't a clue, haven't you, what bricolage is? Of course you haven't. I hadn't died, though. I had a, I, a two-hour lecture. <laughs> I was thinking, on, what was... <laughs> exactly. That was my, I got this two-hour lecture from an academic on bricolage, which is actually, I'll explain, it's the art of taking things from one place and putting them together in a different order, which I think you and I did every single day we were an entrepreneur. But that person <laughs> read a, some kind of academic treatise by some academic in, I don't know, Croatia. Oh, they've they, they written a white paper on it. Or they written a yeah, there's been paper. a white paper, and, the, and I have to say, the students were with me. They were like, what on earth is this? This is no <laughs> use to me at all. And learning about the 17 different types of entrepreneur. I mean, our book, you can read that in, in two hours. And that's mm -hmm. everything from, literally, you've got an idea in the pub, then eventually we take it up to the point where you sell your company to Capgemini. That's, Correct. Yeah. You know, we don't go to you know, past that, which is right. You don't want to sell it to Capgemini. You want to become Microsoft. That's a whole different set of lectures. And entrepreneurship is that gut feel. It's the... It's the dyslexic people who are never going to go to university, who look at things in a different way. Because when I hear the word dyslexic, I'm thinking entrepreneur. You've got a, that different mindset. You need your foil, who's probably a lexic person, who is quite good at the numbers mm. in this. Every entrepreneur, I mean, if you take Richard Branson, the famous dyslexic, unbelievably successful by any measure, and a nice bloke. I've interviewed him five times. He's great fun to be with. Not, don't agree with everything he's ever done, but there we go. Nobody's ever heard of Robert Devereaux, his brother-in-law. Without him, the finance guy. Without him, no virgin. Oh, he's a foil then, basically. Isn't yeah, he's okay. a foil. And every famous entrepreneur, you know, with Elon Musk, it was his brother, who nobody's ever heard, Kimball. With Bill Gates, it was um, uh, Paul, Paul Allen. With, Paul with, Allen. Yeah. with Steve Jobs, it was Woz, Wozniak. It, mm. Everybody, there's this foil in the back. Jeff Bezos, his then wife. Yeah. Who yeah. Yeah, has made lots of money out of all this, let's be honest. But without them, mm. there's no famous person. And so... The best piece of advice I can give to any student is find your foil. Like I was so lucky to meet Chris West in 1967. Mm. We did different courses. We we're in different houses. We've been friends for life. And we can look at any problem from the two perspectives. And when I appear live, if it's very important, I always say, oh, by the way, he's unexpected. Here's Chris West. Because he can speak. But then, because half the audience will love shouty old Mike who, you know, he's dancing on the tables. He's saying crazy stuff. Half of them think he's so full of himself. I hate him. They like Chris, the sensible one. We're almost telepathic now. So when we did marketing strategy at CAS, I said, uh, I showed Chris the existing course materials we were supposed to do. He immediately said, I'm rewriting them. God bless him. I just had him for an hour <laughs> uh, with some really nice Chris, very cleverly thought through stuff on marketing strategy. Then I had a guest, which is now, that's been brilliant, Chris. Let's talk about one of my network who's mm. got an interesting story based around marketing. So... The people I've I had... Oh, to, to mix it up, basically. Yeah. yeah. And it's the real-life stories. So, so far at Regions, I've had uh, Dan Hall from Investec Wealth and Investment, one of my mm -hmm. sponsors, you know, mm -hmm. talk about what it's like to work in a bank and stuff. Then next week, they're going to get Tony um, Waller from CMS, big law firm, mm -hmm. but not only a big law firm. So if you are going to sell your company to Capgemini, you need a CMS, frankly, mm -hmm. you know, fighting on your heart. But also, they've got an incubator with, with 100 companies in it, all the hottest startups. It's very clever. They offer them... Um, Cheap, use it or lose it legal services. So you're trademarking, your contracts. Yeah. We'll do that at a loss. They're trying, to build, they're trying to build a relationship. Yeah. Exactly. So, and you get all this for cheap, but on the base of when you do decide to sell yourself to Google, we do that. That's where we make the big money. They got him coming in. But other people I've had in, um, I hope to get at Regents, are my friend um, uh, Rupert Lee Brown from Caxton FX. It's a billion pound currency card company. Really interesting story. My friend Jamie... Henry, West End theatre producer, very clever. And of course, a lot of it will be, so what's happening in COVID? There's, you know, I've got a guy who does ad tech, advertising technology, mm -hmm. um, which is where, you know, you, you go on the internet, you go on Facebook, you search mountain bikes, and then, oh, look, there's an ad for a mountain yeah, bike. Yeah, the remarketing. 
mythology. He's a lot cleverer than that. But yeah. here's what this guy, Dom Joseph from Captify, told my CAS students. And I can repeat it because that's what he said. And he's like, you know, we own more data on people, not the actual data, of course, it's like pretend data, but than, than Amazon and whatever. So we know exactly what's going on because our customers, you know, it's very clever. He said, here's what he actually said. We at Captify could predict the outcome of the UK election the night before, postcode by postcode, based around their internet activity. So again, if you think you're looking at a website and they don't know and whatever, now this is scary stuff. You can use it on the dark side. You can be Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> but, the, yes. but the point I'm trying to make to the students is use this to your benefit. Mm. My favorite uh, lecture that I gave when I was doing marketing strategy was, um, okay, we're doing marketing strategies. You've got to do Coke versus Pepsi. And Chris came up with some good material. I thought, tell you know what these, these young people want to hear, mm. how to get a billion hits on YouTube. So mm. I thought, I know exactly who I want to talk to. So I actually flew to Los Angeles to meet him specifically. And this is a lovely guy called Scott Bradley. Scott Bradley, jazz pianist. I've known plenty of jazz pianists. We're all poor, let's be honest. And, you know, he's a good jazz pianist. Went to New York because if I can make it there, I can make it anywhere. And he's kind of struggling. Uh, He says, I'm going to give up. I'm going to go to grad school, read calculus. But while I'm here, I'll just do a quick YouTube video. He does 80s tunes in a ragtime style, which is kind of his thing. Mm. Puts it up there. Next morning, he's had 25,000 hits. And including Neil Gaiman, the famous author, who said, this is cool. He says, I'm onto something. Then he starts doing YouTube videos where it's a, it's a modern tune, but done in a ragtime style. Mm. And the whole point of the internet is, or YouTube or Instagram, you don't know what's going to go viral. I mean, Yes, do, yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So he put up one video, which I showed obviously, you. Obviously, this video is going to go viral and put it on YouTube. Well, of course. But you, you just don't know. If it does, if suddenly you and I are getting a million hits, you and I have a conversation about how do we turn this, which is what Scott Bradley did, because he did one video. So a song mm. called Thrift Shop, which is a rap tune, where you've got the drummer, who's badly lit, you can hardly see him, the bass player, Scott playing his piano. Mm. Then Scott's then girlfriend singing it. And my theory is, everybody looked at her and thought, I get this. That got a million hits. Then he turned that into a business model, which is... How do you make money out of music that you don't own? Because he doesn't own any of these tunes. He's not Paul McCartney. Right, okay. And it's a very clever model, which is always moving. So up till COVID, it was like, he puts a video out, a million people watch it. Plenty he, of them. Because he's basically got his audience, basically. He's got he's his got audience. audience. He's had 4 billion hits on YouTube. The last one he did pretty wow. well was the Friends theme tune, Through the Ages. It's the most brilliant piece of video. Shot in the mansion where he lives. Um, and... So a significant number will just say, I'm going to download that, you know, $1.90. I want that track. They'll download it. And he does albums himself. But isn't, isn't, isn't there a rights issue there with that? No, 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 no. I can perform the Beatles. And when I do, if I reduce I Am, if I do I Am the Walrus, you know, mm. John Lennon and Paul McCartney get some money. You know, it's, it's a well-understood thing. So Okay, okay. So when, when the, the Friends theme tune, which also actually features the band themselves, the Rembrandts who did it, they come on at the mm. end. It's just, mm. So... They will be getting money through their publishing company for the fact he used, you know, I'll be there for you. Right, right. But then Scott will sell an album himself. And of course, he has to give the money to the people who own the tracks. Mm. But his big money, and he was making very good money doing that. He's now got a house in Nashville. He's got so many hits and he's got the model right. But of course, postmodern jukebox pre COVID went on tour. And you're not expecting anybody in particular. You might get somebody you saw in a video. Mm. But it's always a brilliant show. We saw it at the Royal Festival Hall. And I was asking my son, you know, which track's that? Oh, that's a, that's a, a Justin Bieber song. You know, he knew the tunes. Mm. Right. Three girl singers in the 20s style, which of course I love. It's, like, I a ma- it's like a mashup, basically, then. It's, it's a like... complete mashup. It's just mm. like Cirque du Soleil, because wow. you're not expecting a particular acrobat. And he could have, you know, I've had this conversation with him. He could have a postmodern jukebox speakeasy mm. with that model in every town in the world. Where it's just like McDonald's, which is if you're going to do yeah, 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 yeah. in Shanghai, there are rules. You know, you cannot do fajitas. You know, you do exactly what we say. Mm. But he personally is the loveliest man you've ever met. And I was just so thrilled to meet him. And he's looking after his artists when they're all starving, you know, because they can't mm. talk. And, mm. But again, he has the same model as me. Let's just get the best artists in the world. Mm. Some of them have gone on to be famous. Some of them haven't. Um, mm. It's the most brilliant way. So what I say to my students about, you know, YouTube, TikTok, um, whatever it is, you know, stick a video up there and hope. And if, if your mates watch it, great. 
I mean, it can be your little calling card. If you go viral, call me up immediately. <laughs> Who knows how you've done this? There's a way of monetizing because for this 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you're the most popular person on the planet. Mm. And, and of course, you want to do it on the light side, which is, I mean, Scott's a brilliant jazz musician. He is not. I mean, just literally last night, I haven't seen it, I probably won't watch it. Piers Morgan interviewed, you know, Gemma Collins, or whatever her name was, who got famous on this. And she's, you know, she can earn 75,000 pounds on Instagram and this, and that, and the other. But she's clearly a tortured soul, poor woman. And she's getting all this abuse. Mm. Oh, Kim Kardashian. You know, the mm. people who are on there just because they're famous and trendy. Mm. That is not long term. Mm. And for all the million people who love you, there's a million people saying, um, here's why, you know, they murder babies. This mm. is the dark side of the internet. Now, the internet loves it that there's this big argument as whether Gemma Collins is a hit heroine or a, a villain. Mm. There's talk. Mm. Now, and then, of course, when you're saying, I love her, I hate her. You it know, sells media. Yeah, it sells media. And then yeah. what's happening is as you're doing that, they, whoever they are, are capturing all your buying information. So they know that Mike is the AG is, he likes cats, he doesn't like dogs. Um, He's interested in a garden shed, you know. The, the key so, question here, you see, Mike. The key question here, Mike, you see, is about TikTok. What's yeah? So have Jeez. you got have you got a TikTok video? No, uh, no, no. You... Because I couldn't carry it off. This is the point. I mean, I, I'd encourage my students to do it because they could carry it. me doing a TikTok. You know, if I got famous, it'd be for the wrong reason, which is. I'm being laughed at or something. I'm just not interested in the experience. Yeah, but you see, you see like Scott Galloway's got, you know, create that Prof yeah. G, Prof, Prof Galloway. So you could be Prof S, Prof, Prof well, Southern. I could, but I don't want to be. I, I'm, <laughs> just, I'm just as famous as I want to be right now. I'm famous enough and good enough to be invited to speak at a university because, frankly, I, I gave him this roadmap. You know, you, you start your little business at Regents you know, on the side, you're skiing, then you become a million, then a million, then save the world. Um, if I make in the next, I don't know, few years, whatever it is, one billionaire who's a nice person, mm-hmm. they'll probably have long since forgotten me by then. And they'll have done something good. They'll have stopped the next COVID or stopped homelessness wherever they come from. Mm-hmm. I can just think, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm 1% responsible for that, possibly. Mm-hmm. If I call them up and say, can I come to Kazakhstan and, you know, and, and meet your dad mm-hmm. and, and, you know, get the guided tour, they'll probably say, yeah, come on, yeah, because you really mm. helped me. And yeah, it's yeah. that legacy giving back. Yes. And, and the thing about technology is, as you and I know, it's accelerating. Yes. So for every TikTok, there's another better one in 10 minutes. Social media, the whole, mm. we hate Twitter and, and all of that because of, you know, Donald Trump or something. Clearly, the people behind Twitter are thinking, we've got to have the next one where we're the good guys. Yeah. We're now perceived as the bad guys. Yeah, yeah. And, and Twitter could destroy its brand overnight, its brand overnight. Literally, everybody could leave Twitter, Facebook, Instagram mm. in an instant mm. if they did something stupid by saying, you know, women should not be entrepreneurs or something, you know, really stupid. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, instantly, they're dead. You know, they're, they're yeah, cancelled. Yeah. Yeah. Then they'll be, oh, we've got super new TikTok type thing. But mm. the genius of TikTok, is, I mean, it's the Chinese. They thought, yeah, YouTube, videos are too long. Let's make them... You know, if we could get down to one second, we've cracked it. Where you get to be famous, <laughs> and and if so, then of course, you know, if you do this, Andrew, you'll be really rich, and you should do what we say, and you know, you should, you know, it's, it's, like, it's like it's like it's like Doctor Evil. It's like, oh, but well, there we go, good evil. One, one million dollars. <laughs> one million dollars. There we go. And of course, <laughs> if if I was twenty five, I'm thinking I've got to get on YouTube and be famous. Thank God it never happened to me, because what would have happened to me personally? Because you can't cope with that when you're 25. Mm. It's like every pop star, you know, you get to 31, you're not a pop star anymore. Um, yeah, but unless, good... unless, you, unless you go back on the tour or you, or you do... Uh, oh, yeah, you... and, and then you're doing all the old tunes. But you see, the zombies, who I know very well, you, you remember the zombies, She's Not There. Mm-hmm. You know, they were back in the, in the 60s, She's Not There, whatever, whatever. And it's basically, most famous ones are Colin Blunstone and Rod Argent. Mm-hmm. And Rod Argent went off to do Argent, then he did the zombie. Yeah. Yeah, and so now, and then the zombies reformed with Colin and Rod, and they had a lovely, lovely man. Well, Steve, uh, who plays in my band or played in my band, it was his dad, Jim Rodford, who had been okay. in Argent, who had been okay. in the Kinks, who'd, and he was the most He'd brilliant. Been in the Kinks of, as well. Oh yeah. Well, wow. uh, and, and there's a nice point to the story, which is, and he's the most brilliant, brilliant guy, and um, he was working on his memoirs. And I was helping him because it's like, yo, please tell me another story, Jim. We're in the pub, just record it. Because the first band he was in 
was called the Mike Cotton Sound, which nobody's ever heard of. But the first serious gig he had was at the Beatles Christmas Show 1964. <laughs> with the Yardbirds, Freddie and the Dreamers, and there's this brilliant picture of them all. Oh, there must have been quite an audience there then. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. And he was just like... Uh, anyway, what happened to Jim, tragically, was he came back from tour, fell backwards and died. And so the family said to me, Mike, you know, he was working on his memoirs. Uh, can you do anything with them? I said, well, I'll have a go. You know, why not? Lovely man, Jim. Um, what, what Jim had, which is absolute blooming gold dust, is a spreadsheet of all his gigs ever. 8,000 of them. And not only was he in all these bands, whenever he came off tour, local band, he played with them because he just loved playing. So I worked on the memoirs. Now, this involved me just so, well, I'll start with the Mike Cotton sound because there's all the history of, you know, his mum and dad. Then he was in, you know, the, the, the Blue Tones and Snort. Then he joins the Mike Cotton sound, which started off as a jazz band, then became a soul band, then became a mm -hmm. rock band, and then... Most of them joined the kinks, as it happened. So wow. I'm interviewing these guys who are in the Mike Cotton sound, specifically Derek Griffiths, the guitarist, and John Beecham, the trombone player. And they were telling me stories of what it was like in the 60s, touring seven days a week in vans, no motorways, no mobile phones. I mean, some of the stories I couldn't put in the book, but these lovely old guys just telling their stories. I mean, just hilarious. I mean, just... Those times of well, driving, driving around in a, trans, a Ford Transit van or something like all that. All of that, and just every single story, you know, some unprintable, some just brilliant. <laughs> if a, literally seven days a week. So I was asking questions like, so how did you wash your stage clothes? You know, because I've been in bands, I understand that stuff. You know, how do you do that? And it's lovely stories of a, a, a day that will never come back. And of course, it's and, 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 and they were literally on, on tour seven days a week. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I looked through Jim's spreadsheet and all the gigs, and I, I literally put in a day off. And it's like, you know, every three weeks they get a day off, you know. But then, anyway. What did they do? Did they sleep in the van, though? Uh, no, no, no. They always stayed in digs. In fact, right, they had okay. a very good agent who made sure they stayed in digs. There are lots of stories about digs and this, that, and the other. So mm -hmm. they had a good agent who made sure they weren't doing, you know, um, Cornwall one day. And yeah, having, yeah, 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 yeah. So they had a good agent. They talked a lot about the agent. And um, then the Beatles weave in and out of the story all the time because Paul McCartney produced a lady called Mary Hopkin. You may know this. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. God. He said, I want the Mike Cotton sound, do the horn section. So they were in Abbey Road just after the White Album with Paul McCartney and another load of great stories. Anyway, the up and down of this is, I worked on this thing and uh, it was just for the family. So I right. produced, uh, this is one of my proudest students. I produced this. It's just a copy of it. We only printed 100. All right. And it, and it cost the family, you know, a couple of grand. Mm. And it's Jim Rodford's side. And that's a picture taken by Steve from a drum riser. Um, uh, at a gig they so he's, did. So he's a bass player, basically. He's yeah. a bass player. Yeah. I mean, the best musician in the world. I mean, just indescribably brilliant. And the nicest guy. Never had a bad and word. he was in the ever. Kings. He was in the Kings. Uh, he was in the Kings for 17 years. Wow. And there's a lovely thing in his spreadsheet, you know, 1980, playing Seattle. Just a note. Man fell through roof. <laughs> <laughs> and I put in the book, was that you? Talk to me about it. And I'm saying, look, please talk to me, talk to me. Anyway, I, we produced this book and I got a friend of mine who I've been teaching on a course who's a printer Mm. And again, it's a bit difficult to describe, but this book is like, it's a nicer cover than you'd expect. Yeah, yeah, the paper's yeah, yeah. nicer. And just being able to give this mm. to Jim's wife, no, Jean, exactly. yeah. 100 copies, uh, that's one of the greatest moments of my life. Mm. And this I is imagine. a labour of love. I mean, I've, I'll, I'll do Argent, his days in Argent next. Wow. Maybe more stories with the Mike Cotton sound. Um, you know, just the love. You, you see, you trigger, you, tr you trigger my thoughts, actually. So one of, the, one of my favourite... Bands. You probably know, you might know this guy, um, Alex Harvey. Oh, know, yeah, sensa yeah. Sensational, sensational Alex Harvey band. With Clem Clemenson. Exactly. Which is a, it was a brilliant guitarist. Absolutely. He still is, for all we know. Yeah. And, and you know, he the, got a, a Gibson SG. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. And you see, I use the Beatles as a metaphor for entrepreneurship. You know, once upon a time, there's some kids passionate about something American rock and roll music. Mm. And then they became the largest local band playing covers. Then they started writing their own songs. Then they became incredibly famous, biggest band in the world. Then it all went horribly wrong for them. You probably remember Apple, their company, was bankrupt at one point. Mm, but they've yeah. come through it, now they leave a legacy. So mm. the sensational Alex Harvey band, he'd been in other bands before. You could do the same about ABBA, Madonna, whoever it is you're mm. into nowadays, Taylor Swift. You've got to be passionate about something. Mm. Earn a few bob, just for fun. It's like, oh, I can earn a living doing this. Then if you're unlucky enough to become unbelievably famous, you see, none of this ever affected Jim. Mm. Jim was just the ultimate, he calls it side man. Right. Um, he had the best time. He did okay. You know, he, mm. um, 
was doing these gigs around the world. I mean, he starts the story of which is, who would have thought? Here I am driving towards Madison Square Gardens. We've sold that. <laughs> who would have thought? A young lad from St. Albans. Let me tell you my story. That's how the book starts. Mm. So, see, this is my passion. I've written this book on my own. I, I did get Chris to read it, let's be honest, you know, because I'm, you know, mm. he's just the best writer in the world. But you see, it's stuff like this, which will live forever. I don't know where this project will go because I thought, mm. let's put it on Amazon. And I thought, no, let's keep it as a 40 quid book. Mm. But if you want one, you can have one. Gene will sign it. Okay. It could be a bit of zombies merchandise. I spoke about that. And a lot of people said, oh. But you see, you yeah. see, the thing is, you see, with, with the kinks, you know, Ray Davis got all yeah. the, I suppose he got all the kind of the, the visibility. But then yeah, obviously, yeah, it's a bit like the point about the entrepreneur and the mm, foil, completely. The, prote the protector, the dream team, you know, the, all the, of that. the cornerstones. Yeah. It's, it's back to that thing about humans need teams. You know, they can't do it all by themselves. But you, they, they, need, they need to build that super team to help them be successful. There you go. Yeah, which is, uh, which, is the, which, is the, which is the great analogy between an entrepreneurship and the music piece that you did. Yeah, because the interesting thing about the Kinks is there's Ray Davis, who is mm. God, um, mm. and there's Dave Davis, his brother, mm. and they've famously fallen out and this, that, and the other. But when the mm. Kinks tour now, I think you know they're both in the band now. They and, and apparently they're mates now. All these years. But there were times when Jim was kind of in the middle when Dave Davis was trying to kill Ray Davis or something. You know, like all these fantastic stories. And Jim is just the glue that keeps it together. Yeah. yeah. He's the guy. I remember once, um, it's very early in the days of Mike Fabgear. I said to Steve, um, oh, you know, our, our bass player can't do this gig. He said, my dad will do it. And I said, what, M Mr. Jim Rutherford? Yeah, he'll do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you're going to pay him. I said, yeah, of course I'll pay him. I said, well, does Jim need to know the numbers in advance? He said, Mike, Jim has played Every song ever written, some that haven't, he'll just wing it and you won't even know. And lo and behold, we did this gig and I made more mistakes than Jim did. And it's my bad. So he, so he played bass. He played. Your yeah. And he literally oh, just... wow. And we do covers, but they're rather souped up. You know, it's mm. like in a different key or because I couldn't sing the original key or there's a stop and a break and a this, that and the other. He, just, he was just at the back playing. And, he, and I mean, the story... I, I, I thought you'd be like a Barry Gibb, you know, like, ah, ah, ah. You know, it's like all those high notes. No, no, no. I've got, <laughs> I, I've got quite a low range. And you know, I'm John Lennon rather than Paul McCartney. I can't do the high notes, you know, and I know I can't do the high notes. That's why I've got three other singers in the band who are musicians and two girl singers now. So it right. sounds. And I've got, a, you got my you got own sound coverage. engineer who yeah. knows to <laughs> turn me down a bit when I'm out of tune, you know. It's like, <laughs> but it's the show. And I mean, I'll tell you an anecdote about that, which is I was invited back to... Um, one of the universities I played years ago. And they had another band on before us. And they were a great bunch of musicians. And they played in bands and this, that, and the other. And then I thought, I wonder what their first number's going to be. And it was a great song. Great song. Um, another Brick in the Wall by the Pink Floyd. So they kicked off with, We don't need no education. And the place cleared. Cleared, yeah, yeah. It's like, I mean, bless them. They just didn't know what they were doing. Whereas with me, it's like I'm out there, I'm, I'm climbing on tables. I'm like, please look at me. What? Well, stay, stay, stay. And they're all... standing, on, standing on the speakers. Yeah. Yeah. All of that and falling off the speakers. I mean, I've come off stage. My wife has said, What's happened to you? I'm like, Oh gosh, I think I fell off the table again. You just don't feel pain on stage. It's great. All I, can, all I can say with you, Mike, you know, is, is that, you know, if even if we had any any questions that I would want to ask you, I feel like we've we've covered, uh, mm. we've covered all the questions anyway. Yeah. But, but what I would say is, I can't thank you. Enough for being on this episode. <laughs> My pleasure. I mean, it's only taken us nearly over a year to get this, get you on the show. Sure, sure. sure. But um, and actually, we we were going to physically record it in a studio in London. You remember we were going to do it oh, in, yeah, yeah, in, yeah. In, in King's Cross, were we? We yeah, should yeah. obviously after all this COVID stuff, we should uh, we should do part two. Oh, but, uh, without question, because it's kind of where do you go from here? You reinvent yourself. I mean, you and I can't retire because we've not really got anything we can retire from. So I'm not retired. I'm I'm, I'm still doing stuff, man. I'm still doing stuff. <sighs> I know, I, I'm, I'm making a joke. It's like, you know, but, but no, you, you don't want to like, it's not like the tyranny of you get a job, you work there all your life, you retire at 65, they give you a clock, mm. whatever. You see, Rolls-Royce were very interesting about this. They had people who would join the company at 18. And if the, if you really have the chops to work at Rolls-Royce, you become an engineering fellow. And right. they literally, you're like going to design like a distinguished the, engineer kind of thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Then you have to retire at 65. Then their life expectancy after that was 18 months. Mm. So that whole bunch of stuff, which is how to stay alive afterwards. Mm. I mean, I, I'm 67 now, you know. I'm not slowing down. I mean, I'm having to do stuff on Zoom. Mm. And also, I know this is my time in my little field, which is just say to everybody on Zoom or something, listen, 
the opportunities out there. There's people with trillions of dollars. If you've got an idea whether you're going to be a freelancer or start the next whatever, give it a go. Beer match is only about failing quickly. And you yes. fail quickly because somebody like Mike says, give me 50 pounds, and they say no. Like I'm back saying, don't know what it was, Andrew. They didn't want to give me money. Sorry, mate. Come up with something else. And if it's no, but, yeah, but this, is, this is the thing. I think this is, the, this is the genius of the stuff that you wrote about, which is nearly 20 years, you know, 20 years ago now, 2002. Yeah, yeah. Is that the the re- to your point? That's I mean, this is why I wanted you to come on the show because I think the relevance of what you you wrote, write about in the book that's obviously now the third edition, which you've obviously updated it with all the kind of latest technology stuff, is is even more relevant. And you know, mm-hmm. and, and you, as you said, you know, as we go through twenty twenty one into tw- you know this next decade, then you know th- there's a world of opportunity out there for people, and I think that people should be you know positive about that. And there's been a lot of you know negative stuff and. You know, there's been a lot of loss that's happened, but you know, it's, it's, it's. I mean, I think the timing of this episode is is fantastic, and I can only thank you for for, for coming to, to talk to us about that. Because, um, and I, I love the stories where you you're mixing up your uh, alter ego. So, you know, oh yeah, I will. I, 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 I look forward to seeing him uh, back on stage. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. I mean, it's you know, do I dare unleash this on the world? But it's um, no, it was it was a brilliant time, and. Um, you see, we all have different masks we met. We wear. When we're at work, we are saying, well, I'm the sales and marketing director of this company, so we're at Akinova, I'm business development, so I've got that face on and mm-hmm. I'm behaving in a certain way. But you see, what I say about sales, which is the key to everything, if you've got sales, good. If you haven't, bad. Mm-hmm. Sales, you know, I always say to my students, what's the attribute that a human being needs to be good at sales? And the answer is, be liked. So they don't like you, don't talk to them. They're not going to listen to you. They'll say, just leave a brochure. They mm. do like you in the broader sense. You seem a nice person, honest. Oh, I like the sound of that Akinova kind of thing. Then you mm. can start an elevator pitch. But sooner or later, you've got to say, look, it's been brilliant chatting. Give me 50 pounds. Mm. And somebody like me is used to that and is used to rejection. You know, mm. I make a joke. You know, I've been chatting girls up since 1971. I'm used to rejection. But it's the, if somebody says no, you ask why. If they give a good reason, oh, fair enough. Never mind. That's for pint. Yeah. But if they say yes, you've got to, you know, um, deal it in a certain way. Yes, no, or maybe. You see, mm. I teach sales to undergraduates. I'm mm. probably the only person on earth. So they'll teach you marketing. They'll teach you business development. And of course, yeah. the dream of shy people is, we'll get our marketing right. We'll have an internet site. And if we build it, they will come. And that's the whole platform app mm. model. Yeah. And yeah, if you do that, great. It will always be a human being forming a relationship with another human being mm. and that's saying, you know, you can play up the stereotype. You're a bit of a cheeky chap, Mike. If it shuts you up, I'll buy something. But it just goes back to when I persuaded this guy, listen, trust me on this, send us 10 grand in advance. In mm-hmm. fact, what I did was I think I said, look, if you buy two courses, I'll give you 50% off. So it looks like a deal. Pay us some money up front and I'll make it up to you afterwards. You know, because honestly, if it had been a, a crap course, I'd have said, look, we've got to give the guy the money back. And, and yeah, please exactly. But See, that's why services are so much easier than products, which is saying, you've got a bit of a problem. You don't have enough beer mats. You know, how about I do an, an hour of beer mat consultancy for you for 50 mm. quid? Because mm. beer mats are really cheap. You can print stuff on them. You know, da, 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 you know. So do you or do you not want to give me an hour's work to do something? Yes or no? Do you trust me? Mm. And of course, if you trust somebody naturally, it's great. Or you might say to somebody, if you said to me, Mike, I need somebody to do content. You know, I'd say, oh, there's a million people. But my mate, Nick Salfeld... You know, who I know personally, who's does a great job, good credentials, nice guy, you'll love him. And I'm, and I'm pretty sure you will. And also his main strength is turning down business when he's too busy or if he thinks the match is wrong. That's the hardest bit of being a freelancer. We've all had builders, roofers, plumbers who are brilliant when they turned up. Hmm. And having problems now because they've overextended. And that's the genius of what Alison does. Because 99 times out of 100, if you're a safe pair of hands, you're undercharging. You're yes. not charging enough. Because with a builder, what you're 90% of, obviously you want a good job of building. What you're paying for is the person to be there at five to eight. And, you know, we had this brilliant plumber just recently who was actually the nephew of one of my girl singers, which is lovely. And there's one day when he couldn't turn up, he was distraught. And mm. he was so sorry, let us down. And we say, look, don't worry. So I'll make it up to you because you know, something had gone wrong, another job or whatever. That's what you want that call at you know, half past seven saying, look, I'm really sorry, I'm going to be half an hour late. And you'll say, oh, that's fine. It's the one that, oh, sorry, yeah, I was busy. Yeah, yeah, sorry, do you have a point? I've got another call coming, so I've got somebody else wants to pay me. You know, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think, yeah, I, think you know, I know what you're talking about there. <laughs> and then your reputation not being, you've done sales and stuff, but look at your CV. You're clearly the safe pair of hands. People say, oh, 
I'll tell you what, you need that doing. Andrew's your man. Um, he'll respond to your email immediately. He'll say no immediately if it's the wrong thing. And he'll just crack on and do it. And, you know, when he says, I can do that, and I'll do it by five o'clock, you'll probably get it by four o'clock. It's, it's a phrase I use in a different context, which is, if you're not sure about whether you trust somebody, they talk a talk. You know, I'm either a brilliant salesperson or I'm good at writing or whatever it is. You try them and prove them. Try me and prove me, which is, okay, could you just do that little thing by about four o'clock? Yeah, piece of cake. Piece of cake, yeah. And, and I'm thinking, yeah, you, you could do that by four o'clock if you're as good as you say. Then you see if it arrives. It arrives at three o'clock. You're thinking, I'm getting a good feeling. But you know, I get this with students, everybody. Oh, yeah, I was going to do that. But, you know, sorry, something popped up. And sorry, I've had a few internet problems where I am. <laughs> you're thinking... <laughs> the dog ate my homework. <laughs> all of that. I mean, I get this with, you know, the students. It breaks my heart. There's um, The best story about punctuality was where I was doing... Um, uh, Little, um, what do you call it? Come on, there So one on, uh, yeah, teams of five. You know, little, yeah, you, know, you get half an hour with me because there's there's 150 of them. You know, so right. or, sorry, 309 of them. So I had to really be regimented. But there's six of you. There's the team leader. Turn mm. up at exactly this time outside the security door. You get half an hour with me. Don't be late. And you know, some of them. Oh, we got lost. You know, all of that. I came up once, and there's a little save them. There was three of them sitting, four of them sitting there, and a woman standing over them. You know, a young student lady. And she said, oh, here's Mike, you know. And they were there, you know, early. And she said, we were here early, Mike. And I said, oh, good. And you know, I made sure they were here because it drives me mad when people are late. And I said, you have never been late for anything in your life, have you? No, I haven't. It drives me mad. My friends are late for dinner. You know, these people there, they're obviously terrified of her. And I just thought immediately, I could recommend that person as an intern, which I do a lot of, mm. on the basis she's going to turn up on time. She'll be there 15 minutes early and she'll do a good job. And then... When I asked her, so what is it you're doing, you know, in your spare time? I'm working in a shirt shop. Right. She's selling shirts to people from Charles Tirrett or something in, in whatever. She said, it's really easy because if one person comes in, they're browsing. So you just let them get on with it. If it's two people, you work out which one is going to do the buying. It's probably the woman, frankly. <laughs> and I thought, I've had 40 years in sales. I can teach you nothing. Again, <laughs> I'm looking at the students thinking, Let's say, Andrew said, oh, I'm really looking for somebody who. And I said, well, actually, one of my students, I'm doing the filter of, they're nice, you'll like them, they'll turn up on time, and they'll mm. do a good analytical job for you remotely. That's basically where we are right now. So I need mm. somebody to research all the podcasts in the world and work out, da, 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 da. I've got students who can do that. And they're the good ones. They're the ones that came up to me after the lecture, even though there's Mm. 150 people in the room so they might add a question and keep in touch and they're the ones I'm giving referrals to even though I haven't taught at CAS for a year uh, they want to do um, MBAs okay. I, just, I just do a page for them they were great they were a team leader they turned up the ones who I can't remember who they are or I thought oh yeah you were the one who always had internet problems was always late with your coursework he's like I'm sorry I don't work at CAS it's you and I do this filter all the time and that's mm. how it works mm. but these students they're going to save the world certainly if mm. I have anything to do with it and I'll be able to say, that was me, you know. In fact, there's no more COVID. There was one student who had this idea for whatever, and, you know, you know that was me. You'd be, do, you'd be doing a selfie with them. You'd be doing a selfie with them. Well, <laughs> well they'll have long since forgotten about me. But no, it's, um, it's about legacy. That's it. When you're young, it's about making money. So, and you realize so you, that money's not important. It's your network. Exactly. Well, one of the things I was going to say to you, to, to finish off today's episode, was about um, for people who, who haven't heard of you, which mm -hmm. I find that incredible, given yeah. your public speaking and obviously all the people that you've mentioned in today's today's episode, was how do they get hold of you? Uh, well, what's, what's, what's the best way of getting hold of you? you well, know, is, is, are, you on the, are you on this thing called the internet? Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm Mike at MikeSouthern.com. It's all over the internet. If you can't find me on the internet and work out a way of connecting with me, you know, MikeSouthern.com, and it's spelled South on, S-O-U-T-H-O-N. Yeah, send me an email. The shorter, the, And I will always respond. There's no PAs or administrators or anything. The shorter the email, the quicker the response you'll get. And mostly, I can find half an hour to talk to you over Zoom. Um, but you need to do, all you need to tell me in advance is, I'm here and I want to get to there from A to B. Not, can I brainstorm lots of business ideas I've got? No. Mm. Come up with one mm. and I'll tell you precisely how to get from have A some, have, to B. Have some focus, yeah. Yeah. And if you, if you want to spend money with me, well, you can't. Um, because mentoring is free. I mean, if you want to buy a copy of The Beer Bad Entrepreneur, great, you know, might cost you seven pounds. And if you've if you bought that and read it, I can tell. I'm not explaining the book to you. So it's just, you see, this is how you approach a mentor saying, when's a good time for you? And they'll say, well, I can do this week. 
Because if you want me in six months, I'm having a clue, you know, get in touch with you then. But if it's mm. like, you know, Thursday or Friday afternoon, I say to my students, they're all around the world. There's, there's about, mm. I've got about 15 of them. Some are in Argentina, some are in Turkey. I'm like, you know, please propose a time. Mm. I can probably do it. I don't mind if it's two o'clock in the morning. It doesn't bother me. Mm. Half an hour, I'll tell you precisely how to get from A to B. And here's the next thing you have to do. Once you've done that, we can have the next session. If you haven't done that thing, best of luck. I mean, I must have mentored face-to-face or on Zoom, I don't know, two, 3,000 people. Most of them I never see again. Some of them start museums. Some are friends for life. And you've got to let that go. You, you know, I bump into them in the street. Did you do what, do what I say? Yes, I did. Mm-hmm. Well, I was going to, then I had a better idea. And you're like, <laughs> yeah, whatever. You know, good luck. Well, what I was going to say to you is, as it, to, to, to angle this episode, was to say that, that, that the next time that we meet, mm-hmm. we will meet and have a, a beer and a G&T. Indeed. That, that is, uh, that, those are wise words. Not I'm advocating drinking. But <laughs> we'll, have our, we'll have our beer mats and our coasters. We'll, we'll, we'll put our G&T on our beer mat. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And, you know, please God, everything's going to be open soon. I mean, I'm lucky enough to be old enough to have had my first jab, COVID vaccination. And it was quite fun because I, I turned up there in Kentish Town. But I'm, I'm so young, you see. It's going to be 2022 before I get my, no, my job. No, they'll accelerate this, clearly. <laughs> uh, no, no, they will because it's clearly the only thing that's working is the vaccination. What was funny was I turned up there at the same time as the local MP, who's Sir Keir Starmer, head of the Labour Party. So I made a big joke on social media. You know, the NHS lined up somebody proper to talk to the beer mad entrepreneur. But no, the vaccination... <laughs> But also, if, if you think historically, this coronavirus is going to go away eventually like Spanish flu. Mm-hmm. Worst case, this time next year. There's light at the end of the tunnel. All the vaccinations may work. Um, but it'll just, I mean, viruses have to go away. Otherwise, they kill us all, and that's the end of it. Yeah, exactly. And we're all older and wiser. So if it did escape from a lab in China, I'm sure the Chinese have kind of worked out not to do that again. Also, we're prepared, which is, when, if this happens, and again, it hasn't happened for 50 years. If it yeah. happens again, we know mm. to lock down, yeah. we know to um, inoculate, you know, vaccinate. Yeah. Isolate and, know, all that stuff. Yeah. and also 90% of us, frankly, <laughs> oh, great, I'm working from home again. Because these poor people are, you know, sort of traveling to London, spending, you know, all this money to sit in an office with people they don't like. Going to meet, <laughs> It's all gone. It's all gone. We can do, and in the insurance industry, which I'm working in now, which is fascinating, I'm having no problem getting half an hour for some of the most senior people in the insurance business for two reasons. One, we've got something hot attack and over. It's definitely, ooh, that sounds interesting. Don't mm-hmm. believe it works. Then it's the, they're in their mansions in Bermuda. They've got half an hour. And also I can qualify them out. If we have that conversation, it doesn't go anywhere. Back burner. I just play the numbers game. But selling over Zoom is not as nice as being in a pub and whatever. But I don't have to get on planes anymore. I don't no. have to. Well, I, no. I, Dying to do so soon, get on a plane, go visit my mates in New York and keep my network going. You know, I definitely need a trip to Bermuda. I'm trying to persuade my boss of this, but then, <laughs> but then the Zoom call seems to fail. But no, but, but it's that. I mean, they told me on the first day, uh, which is something that really cheered me up Mike, there's actually only 150 people in the world who matter in the insurance industry, the most senior. I thought, perfect. As soon as I'm best mates with a significant number of those, We'll get what we want. And we're a service, not a product. Mm. So they say, well, that I can over the thing is good. But if you have something which made tea and made beer mats and this, that, and the other, and da, 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 we'd buy that. I'm back to Henri saying, right, forget the Akinova platform. We're doing this now. He may say, I want to stick with the Akinova platform. But everything is a service in my world. Mm. But everything, but if we build a pro- platform, people will come. Mm. And all my students, it's like, I've got an idea for an app. Of course you do. I've got an idea for a platform. Of course you do. And nothing wrong with the theory. But, you know, you and I know that to build an app or to build a platform, you're starting at about a million pounds. Mm. And it may not work. And even if it does work, those people at Google will just copy it and say, hey, we got something which is better It's Google. Mm. You know, this is... Mm. So it's... But it's, you see, certain people's dream is, you know, build something they will come. Whereas you and I know you have to be in the right pub at the right time, seize the opportunity, do a quick close, mm. get a bit of money there, because they may be impossible to deal with long term. Even though they gave you money and da 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 da, you see, I started off selling training. I had no clue what Unix was, really. Let's be honest. And everybody needed Unix training then. And <laughs> it was the right thing at the right time. I was a chemical engineer before that. Just be at the right place at the right time. Or if you are like me in 1984 or Scott Bradley, you know, two years ago, where if you come to him, look, I've got this idea. I'm going to take people's tunes that I don't own and turn them into ragtime. It's like best of luck with that. 
But you just don't know till you try, but fail early. And a big thing with entrepreneurs is knowing when to give up. It's usually your fall saying that Mike made. We're not delivering to quality. That would be your conversation with me. Or a finance person saying, look, Mike, unless you charge double, we don't make any money. Look, look, look mm. at the numbers. I know you love it mm. and they want it. Unless you charge £500 for it, then I'll have a go. Give me £500. If not, um, then you move on. And, and that's sales. But it's, it's, you know, anyway, sales, my favorite subject, because I've always been a salesman. Everybody thinks I'm an entrepreneur, I'm not. I mean, I am for the band, but mostly, like Henri brings me in, we'd like more revenue, please. Not we design the product, <laughs> not um, come up with some clever marketing. I mean, I can do all that, but no, no, no. I'm speaking to human beings saying, so have we got a deal here? Yes or no? Closing. Always be closing. Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Yes. Right. Well, that, that, to, to finish on a... <laughs> that's so my I, movie of the week this week. Yeah. Um, so in terms of closing, so thank you very much for your time today. My and, pleasure. Um, I, um, you, 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 based on the, on the, um, conversation we i think we've we've traversed the world we've traversed mm. multiple genres mm -hmm. traversed multiple subjects and um i do appreciate your time so which has been my pleasure any time at fantastic, all fantastic episode and uh so that was mike southern uh i don't know mike southern famous author very mm. fa co-author co very famous co-author and bmr entrepreneur and um obviously next year you'll be celebrating 20 years of bringing that that bit, yeah. of, bit of words yeah. to, with the world. And mm. um, obviously, and now a, a professor and public speaker as well. Yeah, absolutely. Teach, teaching the future, the future, future um, billionaires and zillionaires of the world and um, people who are going to make a difference in the world. So thank you very much for the time today. And uh, that was Andrew Turner, founder and host of the GNT Sessions podcast. Take care. <laughs>